This is the work print, and uh, introduce yourself, sir. My name is Jabri, or a.k.a. 2J. I'll be, I'll be using our real names. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but yes, that's who I am. And who I have sitting next to me? Uh, Greg Forrest, if you uh, believe uh, if you believe the hype, man. Exactly. Um, there you go, Chuck D. <laughs> hey, he's the man himself. He's the one who started this whole thing, and I'm just along for the ride. So, But it's always been a fun ride. Wow. And what are we going to be doing today, Mr. Greg Forrest? We're going to talk about Conan the Barbarian, the OG, the original 1982 version. Yeah, this is uh, this is the film that took the sword and sorcery film genre and uh, the fantasy film genre in general and, uh, well, figuratively and literally put it on steroids, I guess. I, I, I was, Arnold, uh, was Arnold doing that at the time? Uh, I don't know. I couldn't tell you if he was. I mean, after Pumping Iron, I only seen clips of Pumping Iron, but... Uh, I can't tell at that time. Man. He was having other recreational activities. Exactly. He was in the real estate at that time also. He, he sure was making his money long before he did Conan. But, yeah, uh, you're right about that. Something I was thinking about is that, yeah, this movie for the sword and sorcery film genre, maybe it started with Excalibur the year before in 81. But like you said, Conan the Barbarian, the 1982 version, was on steroids pretty much. It just kind of lifted the genre kind of. I don't know, transcendent would be the word, but it definitely got started. There's a lot of uh, big time, like that. there's the old story that goes around that everyone talks about when they talk about the blockbuster mm -hmm. is how uh, uh, George Lucas was a big Joseph Campbell guy. And so what we wound up with because Star Wars was such a big hit is a lot of movie executives and writers and uh, directors kind of giving you the clip or getting the cliff notes Joseph Campbell rather than doing what Lucas did and actually sitting down and talking to the guy and reading all the books and so on but John Milius was an aficionado not, not an aficionado he was a a, a, a buddy of uh, a, a comrade in arms mm -hmm. of, uh, of George Lucas and Steven Spielberg and all those guys he's the guy that they said uh, a lot of these guys will say oh Milius is better than all of us You'll, you'll hear you'll hear some of those some of those guys even you know in, in interviews saying that John Milius was you know the guy who was you know the you know the smartest of, of the bunch and, and just the most passionate uh, filmmaker out of them all you know we he's had some ups and downs yeah like any any artist or whatever they have their ups and downs and yeah you talk about Milius it reminds me of the documentary I watched on the THX 1138 Blu-ray about American Zotrope. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, you talk about John Milius, George Lucas, Francis Ford Coppola, and I think that's where he met the composer for Conan the Barbarian, Basil Podouris. Uh, ba Basil, Basil Polidorus. Polidorus. But uh, I've heard him uh, referred to as Basil Polidorus, mm -hmm. but uh, Basil Polidorus, I, either way, you won't be hearing any of this uh, uh, awesome composition music. on mm -hmm. this podcast because... Frankly, I, I would rather uh, we would rather that you just put in your Conan DVD or find it find it on a streaming service or dude pop in the V8. Well, don't pop in the VHS because we're actually watching the long cut. Yeah, the um, international cut. I, believe, I guess yeah. it's called the international or cut. There's a like couple it, yeah. of there's a couple of odds and ends mm -hmm. yeah that were added on, and we'll get to that later. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, this is th uh, for the work print. This is our first. Um, commentary track we haven't done anything like this before none of that matters because we're going to start the flick we were just getting warmed up here so um here we go okay step um <laughs> hit your uh get ready get ready to unpause the the very beginning of the movie right about i'm gonna do like kevin smith with mm -hmm. those batman commentaries right about now or not yes yeah. now mm -hmm. There's the Universal logo. Universal okay. logo. That's always a classic logo. I that like is. that one. Especially if it's uh, in the scope ratio where it looks like you were moving the stars too much. You remember how it looks a little still versus I think it was in the flat ratio. You look like you're kind of sailing through the stars. So we're starting off with a quote that says, That which does not kill us makes us stronger by Frederick Nietzsche. Frederick Nietzsche. It tells you yep. all you need to know about this movie right there. That which Dino uh, De Laurentiis, the man of big. Not just the... Uh, not just the fact that it is that Nietzsche quote, but the mm. fact that it is any Nietzsche quote <laughs> tells you a whole lot about the uh, the ideals in this movie. Arnold Schwarzenegger. James Earl Jones. Yes. Now, I remember I listened to part of the original commentary track on the DVD where Schwarzenegger was kind of 
you know, lost at how he got top billing over James Earl Jones. And he was just very humbled by it. And uh, there was a snippet I read from uh, Schwarzenegger's autobiography where he talked about he and James Earl Jones, like, talking about James Earl Jones growing up, uh, I believe, in Georgia where he was born. You know, um, I have to get the facts from you where James Earl Jones had grown up. And they swapped a little acting tips and workout tips, like Schwarzenegger telling him, hey, this is how you can work out a little bit, and James Earl Jones would give him the acting side of Very it. Very cool. Said there was, I don't know if they're still friends nowadays. You know, these things happen over here, but said they became pretty good friends. Now, we have the quote, the sword is burning. You get the anvil of crime theme. If this does not get your juices going and wants you to make eat red meat and just go take out somebody, really don't want you to do that. I don't know if you're human or not. This film, is a classic film, theme. Film music sounds nothing like this now. No uh, way, you, no you way. Can, you can go see any big summer blockbuster now, and you're, the scores are pretty much interchangeable now. Like, yeah. I mean, th- this 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 isn't technically a superhero movie, but I guess mm. it's in the same line, right? The so, same line, yeah. So, I mean, it was a comic book. It was a, a, a series of short stories and novels, like the mm-hmm. occasional novel by uh, Robert E. Howard. I think he did one novel, one Conan novel. You only did one Conan and novel. And a whole, whole bunch of short stories. I've read a few of them. And I'm, we're not Conan experts, by the way. We just really no like this movie. We really like the character. Um, I even liked... The the the, car, the syndicated cartoon Conan the Adventurer in the uh folks there's your fan because I think I just stuck to the movies and that was it mid nineties and uh, now would you believe that I only watched this movie for the first time ever I think it was like about ten or eleven years ago mm. it wasn't on cable circulation that much I never went on my way to rent it but then uh, I think I bought it for my dad or I bought it for myself because I saw clips of the movie. Now, most of the time, if I'm saying I haven't seen the movie, it's either, number one, I haven't watched it from fade in to fade out. I've seen clips of the movie. So we'll say 12 years ago was really the first time I watched it from beginning to end. And I watched it late night at my parents' house. And I was like, yeah, this is a hell of a movie. I like it. It was gleefully brutal. So around 2002, you saw it. 2000, 2003, first yeah. I, I think I saw this for the first time. Um, I, oh, well, then, then I'm, I'm in the same boat. I saw <clears throat> Destroyer first. Yeah, same here. So the 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 movie that everybody points to, is, ugh, um, I actually stop for. I kind of like Destroyer. I think I think uh, you probably like it a little at least. You know? Hey, it's got Will Chamberlain. The yes. credit written by John Milas and Oliver friggin' Stone. And Oliver Stone, who uh, you talk that, about polar opposites as writers. Yeah, no joke. I mean, you, you especially getting the political. Yeah, realm, you got right? a diehard conservative, a die uh, and, a, and a diehard. Um, Maybe libertarian. Yeah, liberal? well, um, I I think they would both. I, uh, well, uh, John Milius described himself as a Zen anarchist, whatever mm. that means, right? You, you yeah, know, have, <laughs> have fun with that. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, Oliver Stone definitely more liberal than Milius was, de- mm. uh, it, you know, by a long shot. What I like about this title sequence, by the way, is um, the lighting, especially the flames on. Uh, Young Conan and his and his mother, Young Conan, played by Nev Campbell. Not really. <laughs> um, what I love about and I love this speech, by the way. Uh, that this this lets me know that this is basically a western with mm-hmm. uh, with swords, uh, because he starts you know pointing pointing to that sword, which might as well be a six shooter, and says, "This you can trust, son." You know that that's that's like that, right. That's probably one of the most badass swords in the movie that oh, was ever yeah. made. I mean, hey, if I had to, if I had to own a sword, it would be the one from Conan. Yeah. Well, what what I love about that uh, what I love about that title sequence, mm-hmm. it looks a lot like those Frazetta paintings. Mm-hmm. It looks a lot like the like that kind of fantasy art that was real big, you know, at the time. You would go to we I mentioned that that uh, Kroger grocery store. A oh, while Kroger, ago. yeah, with the gray or the black overhang when you went in, you know you're in a Kroger store. But sadly, Kroger is gone. I think they're still thriving in Houston, but H E B rules the roost. Now we're talking about now we're talking about old grocery stores again. Oh yeah, but, we're still but, gonna be um, focused on the movie. But that's where um. That's where you would find uh, Savage Sword of Conan mm-hmm. in the big magazine format. Yeah, like the 8 by 11 8 yeah, and a half by yeah, 11 and Yeah, and uh, the Punisher had a magazine, too. I think I had a and reprint a, of that you know, Punisher there, there one. Were a, there were a few, but the cover art was always really, I mean, if you're a 10-year-old kid in the 80s and you're just walking around the grocery store, hey, uh, Mom, I'm going to hang out by the magazines and, and you go do the boring stuff. Okay, mm-hmm. you know. Don't you look know, at those, don't you know look at those Playboys think. that you're not supposed to. <laughs> don't, don't look at those uh, Playboys and penthouses that you can't find anywhere anymore. Shoot, yeah, uh, the rip of the par- to get into those. Because yeah. the parents' groups got mad. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Conan mags had, like, really lurid cover art, but they were always really, really beautifully painted. And uh, that that's... It was part of the culture back then. Fantasy art was a huge part of the culture, and 
I don't know if it really is as much anymore. Fantasy gaming is, but like just going somewhere, like you know, you walk into a grocery store and you see that that's unheard of. No way. Uh, if you're talking about going to just a grocery store, you're gonna see like Glamour magazines, Men's Health magazines, Entertainment Weekly, Newsweek, um, Sports Illustrated commemorative edition of the Spurs championship. Spurs fans just throwing it in there. But yeah, if you're talking <laughs> about just uh, comic books and magazines with like anything of that type, you're not going to see in the grocery store. You pretty much have to go to a Barnes & Noble, which is pretty much is still the only existing bookstore that you can go to to find anything. Yeah. No, not even magazines. They don't sell a lot of comic books, I think, in those stores. You have to go to a comic book store right. pretty much to get that type of selection. Absolutely. Um, and where are we now? Okay, so this is when uh, the raid of the village begins. We're in, we're in what Elmore Leonard would say to avoid. Mm -hmm. Avoid prologues, right? Avoid prologues, um, yeah. But I, it, if, if you've seen this movie... Beautiful you know, shot, this scene oh right here, God, the shafts yes. of light. Yeah, I like shafts this. of light in the movie, I especially like how snow is used. Absolutely. It's, just, it's like one of those paintings, and you know, this way the shot is composed, it's beautiful. If, if, yeah. if, you've seen, if you've seen, oh yeah, well it's, um, and I, I'm pointing to a screen, but there's, uh, there, there, there's, sha there's shafts of light, there's dust and fog and smoke behind it, which always makes light pop on a screen. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if digital picks it up as well as film. But it looks beautiful. It, either way, it looks gorgeous. Well, digital, it's tough to say. Like, uh, I listened to the commentary track for Collateral, Michael Mann's movie. Yeah. He raves about how he likes digital because he can pick up a little bit better. Night. And Light. that's old digital. That was old digital, yeah. That was 2004. And that, movie, that movie's 10 years old this year. Anyway. Now they have, like, super duper high def. Yeah, and uh, and there's, some, there's still some filmmakers that want to stick to film. And I just remember my days as a projectionist. Oh, look at the violence in this movie, man. And um, <laughs> something something you definitely would not see now are all the horse stunts. Um, that kind of stuff just wouldn't fly now. And, I, you know, rightfully so, I think. I don't think you necessarily... I, I think, the, like, that kind of horse stunt work where you got horses falling over and tripping and stuff like that. You see it in a lot of spaghetti westerns. Um, mm -hmm. I was watching uh, For the Apocalypse the other night. For the There's Apocalypse, tons yeah. of it Pretty in there. Pretty good spaghetti western. Pretty and good, yeah. But I um, think uh, what started where... Uh, you didn't see animals harmed in movies as much as often attributed to a movie called Heaven's Gate. Uh, uh, Michael Cimino's movie. Uh, I'll probably have to do my solo podcast on that if I have three hours and 40 minutes on live. We have to I'll talk about that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you got to watch the movie. i got to watch but, the movie all the way through, but yeah, I'll you it, gotta, right? You probably need to watch it first, but yeah, there was horses harmed and animals harmed in the making of that movie. I think that's really when you started having the American Humane Association get involved and that's why you don't see it often nowadays i mean and now now you don't even need to because you got mm -hmm. cg and and you know yeah. it's it's uh it it's passable um i've got some i've got some notes here i don't go wanna, for it. i'm not going to go through everything but um when i was watching this uh a few weeks ago i noticed that there's at the very beginning conan's father tells him that this uh this, I, do, I don't exa know exactly what he says, but this land... Is it the riddle of steel? Well, well uh, he talks about the riddle of steel, but he said, mm -hmm. he's got this key line, not gods, just men. Not gods, um, just men. Yeah, that, that, um, and it, uh, a humanist philosophy. Uh, who, who, can, uh, who can you trust? Um, no one but, you know, no one but this, this tool in your hands, which, mm -hmm. is, a, which is a very, uh, yeah, rugged mm -hmm. individualist and a very, a very humanist philosophy. So that's probably where Miles kicks in. Oh, definitely. To an extent, yeah. Oh, definitely, definitely. And absolutely. would you say the tone of this movie, maybe as it goes along, because I remember towards the end of the movie, Conan is praying to Krom, he says something like, to hell with you. I was like, okay, that's a little bit different for this type of movie. Because most of these types of movies are sword and sorcery, men are pretty <laughs> don't grant me my wish to get revenge pretty much fuck you but it's um, in, but yeah. it's in line with that it's in line with that philosophy at the beginning of the of, mm. at the beginning of the movie it's it's more in line with what conan's father tells him than um anything else that uh, conan would have learned mm -hmm. uh had he not been kidnapped by uh false of doom false of doom and yeah. uh sven Oli thorson is that who we're looking at now yeah. with the betty page haircut and the bizarre looking uniform and i think this guy right here is a former football player i, I believe. think so now yeah. sven Oli thorson is also in the running man yeah he's okay. uh i have to go score some steroids he's the <laughs> he's the guy who uh, is like richard dawson's uh bodyguard okay i the think big, i remember that guy vaguely. in the yeah. big blue uniform that was the, him okay and, like um, a buzz cut or yeah, something like that. Yeah, and he's in he's in Kevin Smith's Mallrats. He plays, I haven't seen Mallrats. Mallrats is a very funny movie. He he plays uh, um, 
he plays a, a, a sh- the shopping mall security guard named mm-hmm. Lafours, and <laughs> uh, Jay says, "I hear he's even got two kills." So it, it's it's he's uh, he's very he's very good in that. He just kind of stands around and, and gets chumped. But um, yeah, James, uh, they, James Earl Jones, James that Earl wig, Jones, the who, weave almost in a way, I guess. <laughs> who, along with Max von Sydow, adds uh, adds a touch of class to this movie. A little gravitas to it. Yeah, that world class known actors. That it, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That it wouldn't have if it was just. I mean, not, nothing against nothing against the other actors. There's mm. Conan. There's Conan's mom. There's Conan's mom. Far she out. got that sword ready. Um, and James Earl Jones, that look. Nothing against nothing against the other actors. Um, they all they all do good work. Arnold's good in it, I think. He's always been good. I yeah. mean, unfortunately, he's had a bad string of movies since uh, uh, he stepped down as governor. His term had ended because he hasn't had a hit, with the exception of the Expendables movies. He had a few bad ones before the governor. <laughs> yeah, that too, with Collateral Damage. Well, I don't know how that one was, but um, Eraser, I still remember, Eraser's is pretty good. Eraser's all right. Eraser's okay. Mm-hmm. Um what was that one? The sixth day. Yes. That was tough. Uh, that was a tough one, man. Man, I just had some good food. Don't. I want to keep it down before you mention <laughs> the some sixth. Nachos. And, some nachos. And <laughs> he was James Earl Jones. Looks like he's, you know, he's got that mean, mofo but, look. He's but, turning but away. That's, um, that's also in line with what um, science fiction and fantasy films. Uh, they, they, they're they're all kind of following. Yeah, that head coming that off, and then mom just collapses. And he's got. And notice this, he lets go of Mother's hand, Mm -hmm. and he looks at his own hand, and what does it look like? Right about there. He's going for the sword. Well, it looks like that snake. Oh, that snake. It looks like the Ah. the set. Yeah, Mm -hmm. right? Um, So there's that that theme keeps popping up, the the snake, uh, the two snakes facing each other, which I've seen on Mm -hmm. Um, T-shirts, bootleg shirts, of course. Bootleg but, um, shirts. Oh, okay. there's, there's, there's so much bootleg Conan stuff out there. But um, the uh, forgot what I was saying. It, it's it uh, it's no biggie. It'll come back to me. R-rated fantasy. Yes. Um, we don't have that anymore, do we? We bemoan that we're not getting R-rated, <clears throat> hardcore R-rated fantasy movies nowadays because I don't know if it's just the money they invest in these movies just getting higher to everybody versus back in the day they would spend enough money movies, but they make it for the right audience. Um, now, the sequence that just ended with the raid on the village, what's so great about it is the, the dialogue is minimal, and the music carries it. And Miles had said that he wanted something operatic when he was doing this movie. And uh, the way it's just shot and edited, it makes you think about how action scenes are shot and edited nowadays. Just use wide takes and just use some good cutting versus quit trying to do the... <laughs> in your face fighting styles like cut 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 should, cut should we should we mention the uh, the unmentionable name of uh <laughs> go for it yeah well um those michael bay robot fighting scenes those yes, transformers those, fight yes. scenes are impossible mm-hmm. to watch and uh that that you know we're not the first to say this mm-hmm. um but uh wide shots uh you can Get a lot more information out mm-hmm. in, a, in a more compact form. Yeah, you I mean, get, and, and it, it looks it looks bigger, but what you actually have is what film is really designed to do is to convey an image instead. Mm-hmm. Is is you know you bring in words to life. Yeah, yeah, and you gotta burn this in people's minds, the imagery, and you know. Also, we talk about how action scenes are done. Think about Raiders of the Lost Ark. I mean, remember Spielberg got nominated Best Director at the Oscars for Raiders of the Lost Ark. Unfortunately, he lost to Warren Beatty for Reds. But you really don't win Oscars for directing just a straight-out action flick. You only win an Oscar if you direct an action flick that probably has an important message to it, like an epic movie like Ben-Hur, Lord of the Rings. But if you're just doing a popcorn action flick and you direct it pretty well, this is the wheel portion, right? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, this scrawny little kid... Busting the Arnold Schwarzenegger. One of my favorite scenes uh, that this w- I found this picking when I was a kid. The first time I saw this, I, I just thought that's a really good way to tell a story. Mm-hmm. Is he's turning that wheel, mm-hmm. um, and then suddenly he's Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's Arnold Schwarzenegger. His, he's final, his final memory of his mother mm-hmm. is of her defending him. Yes. Of course, he falls in love with a warrior woman, right? I yeah, Sandal Bergman. You can't help it. Yeah, yeah. He's he's got he's got respect. He's like, that's my kind of girl. That's my, my kind of that, girl. You know, it's just kind of like a girl. Just the mama like, thing is like, man, my like mama defended mom. me. Yeah, just like mama did. She was gonna whip out that sword, but 
Darth Vader's eyes, sorry, James Earl Jones' eyes kind of hypnotized me. I was reading some message where some people thought, did he hypnotize the character in a way? And she kind of just let her guard down, and then he kind of turns away and whoops out that sword. Okay. We some, some people would, oh, yes, definitely. Okay, there is there's Arnold's legs. My, my legs look exactly like that. Okay, mine are not like that. They're probably half of his size, <laughs> so... Um, I'm trying to remember what I heard about how they shot this scene when they developed into Schwarzenegger, so he's probably not pushing it in this shot right here. He's got the long hair. See his nose, and he rises. And There's guess, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Mr. Hercules from New York. Yeah, I was about Hercules to say, I New guess York. this is maybe the fourth film? Probably his fourth film. Yeah, this, yeah a lot um, of people think this is his first movie, but he had done a few more before that. But Her- this is the Hercules, movie. That, Hercules uh, Goes Bananas. Hercules or, Goes or Bananas. Or Hercules yes. in New York. That's the same yeah. movie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Pumping Iron, Stay Pumping Hungry, Iron was one of them. Yeah. and Stay there's Hungry. probably something else I in think there. he was in a Western somewhere. He is, that's right, he's in a Western. He's in a Western, yeah, okay. Western. So give Schwarzenegger props for this. The image he portrays is like this is big buff guy can just you know chop people in half with a gun or just crush them with his biceps. <laughs> he has some damn good movies. He has some of the best action movies, some of the best sci-fi movies. He had he had enough success early on to be able to make that call. Yeah. Um, I think a little bit later he said, well, I have to make a movie sometime mm-hmm. and I'm going to do this one now. But, um, ri- and i got to stop doing that. Everybody's got a <laughs> fucking bad Arnold Schwarzenegger impression. But um, it's like that and Christopher Walken. It's, you know, those two. I'm going to start doing Gallagher <laughs> instead. Um, but uh, he um, he had enough success with Conan, which did well. The first this this movie did very well. Yeah, it made it made a profit at the box office. I think they say once they hit their numbers, anything else is pure profit at that point. So the movie did well. Terminator, Commando, Terminator, Commando. Those those three like it really pretty much established him. I mean, he was being parodied in uh, Cracked magazine. Yeah, they had a, a parody called Commando. <laughs> And um, <laughs> he, uh, and they said uh, something like uh, Matrix, John Matrix. Oh, I forget what they were really called. John Mattress or something. But John Mattress. What, what, um, why, what do you? Uh, why do you have to kill everybody in the scene? And, and he said, I, I wanted it to be like Nightmare on Elmstrasse or something like that. <laughs> and so he was part of the culture by then. I mean, mm-hmm. not not just a movie star, but a huge movie star a I pop think, culture fabric I think much. he had yeah. kind of usurped Harrison Ford's popularity uh, right about that time because first in the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark great movie everybody loves it Temple of Doom immortal classic yeah yeah Temple of Doom did well Tim, Temple of Doom did well I think like 179 million box office in the US alone but uh, it, it didn't quite have the the, the um it didn't quite have the oomph that Raiders had uh, orig- initially, and mm-hmm. then by that time, Harrison Ford was off doing movies like Witness anyway, so he was yeah. doing he was doing more serious kind of stuff. Yeah, trying so, to just uh, I guess uh, vary his resume a little bit. Yeah, yeah, when he did Witness, he got nominated for Best Actor. He definitely that usurped, was his only nomination. He definitely usurped Stallone's popularity mm-hmm. because in the early '80s, people were already going, "Oh, Rocky Three, are you sure you really want to?" You know, yeah, a third movie about a boxer. And yeah. And with those Rocky movies, I mean, he tried to present a challenge through each movie, probably what any athlete or anybody in life goes through. So that's probably why they were able to get away with six movies. So Schwarzenegger is in a pit right now. Conan the Gladiator. He's the gladiator. He's learning how to fight. And we're, we're starting. We're starting to notice. And, and you know, if you've seen this movie, if you've seen this movie before, then uh, maybe you also have noticed that this is an episodic film most of the time. That's another thing that a lot of uh, a lot of writers uh, or writing teachers or scholars or whatever will tell you not to do. But it works perfectly for this film because each one of these little episodes uh, really does add to uh, the overall, like the big finale where he goes after Thulsa Doom, where he literally says, who, who now is your father but I, which may have... Uh, May or may not have been a little nod to. to I, I don't think it was. I think that was already part of it. But uh, kind of Empire Strikes Back. And yeah. Then towards the end, he keeps ev- everybody was following that that kind of pattern back then. Mm-hmm. It's it's that Joseph Campbell pattern, you know. Yeah, and uh, Campbell's probably the textbook, but like you said, Lucas kind of just ran away with it. Definitely. They were using that for a while, and who knows what textbook they're using nowadays for portrayal of heroes? Because with TV, I'm noticing is that you have a lot of anti heroes on TV. Yes. And they're just trying to shade him. It's like nobody's wholly good, nobody's wholly bad. Walter White. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Walter Breaking White. Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad. I need to watch uh, Breaking Bad. Good show. Good, good show. show. 
Is it um, the greatest show ever? Because a lot of people think it's one of the greatest I, TV shows I ever. I wouldn't be able to nah, say. I, I, don't, I don't watch a lot of TV. I'll pick, I'll pick a show now and then mm-hmm. um, to check out that uh, sounds interesting. I, I watched it because it was a crime show, and mm-hmm. I, I, like, I like some crime. You know, Crime is always good. I, I, like, I, love, I love that genre. Um, but um, let's see oh, here. Yeah, Where are we? A sword and, uh, ah, I think uh, the guy that's coming up behind him is Trainer. I think that was the actual... Uh, the real Martial guy, master, the real guy, yeah. yeah. That, uh, taught Arnold how to use the sword, so he's here in the film as well. And is is the uh, is the most quoted scene in the movie uh, coming up next? What is best in life? Not yet. <laughs> the trainer <laughs> just kicked the shit out of him. Oh, dude. this is this is where he uh, he's learning how to get himself educated. Yeah, and then they kind of give somebody to him to kind of feed him a little in bit. More ways than he, one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Far out. Yeah, so they usher in. Um, yeah, now we get quiet. <laughs> yeah, we get quiet, yeah. And he's kind of like on all fours, like he's hungry. So, okay, we got our first boobies right here. That's uh, when they gleefully did this stuff in the 80s. Definitely. And uh, again, that's, that's, that's part of. Uh, that's part of what made those Conan stories really tick, at least at least visually. Mm-hmm. If you were into the comics at that time, the the 70s and 80s, those, those uh, Roy Thomas comics. I mean, he was Roy Thomas was writing. He was taking Robert E. Howard's original stories and adapting them most of the time, and uh, occasionally, I believe Roy Thomas would write his own. But uh, he was doing that not only for Marvel's monthly uh, color comic book but also for the black and white Savage Sword books. And the Savage Sword books were the ones that were a little more, uh, a little more adult, um, hence the magazine format. If they, were in small, if they were in regular small comic book format, uh, like a traditional it. comic book, the Comics Code Authority would have had... Yeah, they would have had more say as to what could go and what couldn't go. Mm-hmm. So you basically have two Conan uh, comic book continuities going on there, although even Robert E. Howard's original stories, there's, uh, they're just episodic, too. I mean, and then that's, that's what makes this movie, um, at the time, uh, really the best representation in film of uh, of the character, uh, it's the only representation in film of the character at the time. 1982. 1982. We'll have to look up the date or I'll check it out. And I think here comes one of the most famous lines, movie lines, I, <laughs> ever. I'm sure there are remixes out there somewhere. And this is this is not Mako right here, right? No, he's later on in the movie, I think. The open step, a fleet horse, falcons at your wrists, and the wind in your hair. Shut up, Pansy. Yeah. He's like, wrong. Conan, what is best in life? Conan, what is best in life? To kill Cut. shit. To kill shit. Be a machine. <laughs> and hear the lamentation of women. Okay? <laughs> that is good. Good. That is good. And then they let him go. Yeah. Oh, he figured it out. To crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and hear the limitations of their women. So when you go to work, I guess you can say, hey, I'm going to crush my enemies or my coworker." <laughs> And see them driven before me when I get that bonus. Yeah. Now the women part you have to throw out. But yeah. <laughs> no, you can't do that now. Can't do that work. No. That's not gonna happen. That's not gonna happen. But uh, just when we're talking about this movie, what's so gleefy, what's so great about it, just like I said, how gleefully violent it is, and just it's just kind of raw in a way. You don't see these movies made too much nowadays because no. don't know if the market is there for it or they may be out there. But TV shows like Game of Thrones, I guess. Yeah, if I had the money to watch HBO, Which I've yeah. never seen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, every, everybody. everybody would, would, talks about it and raves classic, about it. Classic me. It's one of those mm-hmm. things where everybody knows about it but me. It's like I've seen one episode of Walking Dead. Mm-hmm. You know, same thing. One of these days. Yeah, one of these days we'll catch up to it. That's, uh, that's my grandfather talking. One of these days. But, um, so, 82, right? Yeah, 82. I want to say uh, Conan, June or July of 82. Conan, Blade Runner, Conan, Poltergeist, Blade Runner, Poltergeist uh, Tron, 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 Star Trek II: The Wrath of Khan, E friggin' T. Yeah. John Carpenter's The Thing. The Thing. An Officer and a Gentleman. Yes. Firefox, I believe. Oh, that may have been later in the year. Dark Crystal was later on in the year. I think December of '82. Right. But if we focus Still on counts. the summer of A2, yeah. If we're, if, if we're thinking all 12 issues of Starlog that yeah. year, we're just Ooh, trying to think. man. <laughs> Starlog. Especially in '82. Man, you know, you probably had to be like the kid in the candy store. That's a, that's, a, that's another thing you used to be able to see on the grocery store shelves. You Starlog. Get Starlog and Fangoria. Mm-hmm. And, and Fangoria is probably for the horror 
poor busting his star log. I yeah. mean, like, a cover of the Black Hole, the old Disney movie. Yeah. Uh, just the design of the Cygnus spaceship, probably one of the best designs ever. That's what tells you that uh, science fiction doesn't quite, unfortunately, doesn't quite have the uh, the social uh, cachet it used to have because you could still get Fangoria. Starlog, they uh, they stopped they stopped printing a while back. It's a bummer because it was a really good magazine. And I think there's other magazines, but probably nowhere near uh, the league of Starlog. They show SmackDown mm-hmm. on the Sci-Fi Channel. I guess they got paid more. bills. Yeah, yeah they got to pay the bills. It used to be ECW. Yeah, with the uh, because I don't have Sci-Fi Channel anymore. But either they're making their money off of wrestling or those movies, the Boa monster movies. Boa versus Python. Boa versus Gerbil. Yeah, Spider versus Rat. Yeah, Spider versus Rat. <laughs> Cat. Super Cat versus uh, Mega Dog or something, and uh, the only thing with those movies, like, yeah, they don't they don't have it like the '80s was. was like, look, they were gleefully violent, but you had the TNA in there. But Definitely, yeah, we're getting juvenile in this. Well, this this, so this movie <laughs> th- this is a movie for grown ups. Yes. Um, that almost had an action figure line. Almost did. Almost did. And why um, not? Well. Because there are so many blood bags going off in this movie, okay. that Mattel mm-hmm. said, "You know what? We we probably can't do this. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take that um, that Conan, and, and maybe this story is apocryphal. I from from what I've read, this is the truth. We're gonna take uh, Conan and give him a page boy haircut, and instead of." Uh, Instead of uh, we're gonna we're gonna change Thulsa Doom up a little bit. Mm-hmm. We're gonna give him a a, 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 yellow, s- a skull face. A skull face, a yellow one. Masters of the universe. And he sounded like he had a little uh, southern twang on his voice. Skeletor, didn't it? Didn't Skeletor. It? Skeletor. Yeah, oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. didn't he have a little? Oh, yeah, he went. I'm gonna right, stop right, you like yeah. a yeah. stop you like a bug or something like that. That cartoon is impossible to watch. <laughs> that, 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 I haven't that watched 80s, it in a minute. That eighty Seaman man cartoon is just really rough, man. It's tough. The one from. Uh, the early 2000s. The early 2000s I saw that one. Pretty decent. Yeah. Well, what, what was cool, what they did with that cartoon, is like they made Adam kind of a small dude, and then we turned to He-Man, he yeah. was buff. Yeah. So there was a contrast versus it's the same guy, kind of like, oh, it's Clark Kent. It's Clark Kent, yeah. But this guy is like skinny, and his haircut was different than he turned into He-Man. And that cartoon didn't last long, but I did watch it, and that's also when uh, they had Transformers Armada right. come out at that point. Conan is now uh, taking the sword of a king, which... Uh, Tells us a little bit about his own destiny later on. Um, hero's journey, which is hero's journey, which uh, and, and on a macro level, like mm-hmm. big, big level hero's journey, like book nine hundred and four hero's <laughs> journey. But um, unfortunately, we don't we don't get to see that movie. We only get this. We get Conan the Destroyer. We got a remake a few years ago, uh, <coughs> directed by. Did you see it? No. Oh, I okay. Just I didn't see. Didn't it Didn't want to bother with this. Like, why? Marcus Nispel. I'm mm-hmm. not a fan. You know. But um, yeah, he he takes the sword of a king, and uh, in a couple minutes here, he's gonna cut his own chains. Uh, workers of the world unite and all that. Yep. Right. It's a, which surprisingly marks his view for a film uh, directed by a, a staunch conservative. A staunch conservative. Yeah. So he could be just all over the map of his beliefs. And speaking of John Miles, when I think there's a documentary out there about him. Watch it. It's on. Net, it's on. Uh, do you have Netflix streaming or? Just, yes, okay. Netflix stream. Yeah. Watch it. It's called. It's just called Milius, and it's great. All right, he cuts his chains loose, and then the dog is barking. The dog's like, hey, hey, The music hey, is hey, rising. Hey. Arnold's looking at us. Does the dog want to eat the chains? What and he might want that? to. He's I'm got not the clown teeth for in it. the movie. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, we are not here to clown uh, Conan the Barbarian at all, uh, except that he's standing in front of what looks like a, a big mushroom. giant mushroom. Yeah. You know, he's, he's walked into the Allman Brothers' Eat a Peach or something. <laughs> um, no, wait, but wasn't that a giant peach? I don't remember. Jesus yeah, it could Christ. be. Um, <laughs> but uh, here's, the, uh, here's the witch scene. Um, I don't remember what the actress's name is. Me either, but yeah, I just remember what happens after. I just know, I just know from the old audio commentary, because mm-hmm. what we're doing right now mm-hmm. um, is officially the new audio commentary, unofficially official, um, that she was in Arnold's Cigar Club. Uh, oh, yeah, he's a cigar smoker. Yeah. I don't know if he still does it nowadays. Yeah, that's yeah. bad for you. That's, Never. That's not good. I've had a couple. I'm going to get you one now. <laughs> no, 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 no. You've had soda and... Nachos, uh, yeah, you, you know, you can great. indulge a little bit longer than just great. burn it off this diet. weekend. <laughs> terrible. Um, again, I'm not that bad. I'm gonna leave that astray. Again, <laughs> episodic. Uh, we're we're now in the uh, uh, the witchy woman uh, episode here of the film. 
uh, which again takes the character back to his pulp roots. This is uh, taking you right back to those magazines. This could have been and probably was. Again, I haven't read all the stories. I've got them on a shelf somewhere. I got to finish them. But uh, this, you know, could have been one of the stories right just lifted right out of uh, right out of Robert E. Howard, whose stories really ought to be public domain by now. By the way. But uh, because of various copyright laws, uh, are not dang so copyright, copyright laws. And uh, yeah, you talk about you've read a lot more. You're a little bit more versed in the Conan the stories than I am. I just got the movie knowledge about it. Is uh, like you said, they picked certain aspects of the story. I mean, they were doing that for probably the James Bond movies. Because I remember reading about For Your Eyes Only that it was based on a short story, and then they picked parts from certain novels and short stories. Yeah, most of the most of the Bond films a lot of the times they would just take the title and write uh, and write a very bare bones uh, script mm-hmm. um, well I mean the, the script would be its own thing and yeah. um, with the bond with the bond novels they're very very different I've uh, I've done two of those I've done um, I've read Casino Royale and one other, I don't, uh, I don't remember which one, but it was, yeah, definitely, uh, definitely very different. Um, we're about to see yeah. why Conan distrusts magic, or at least, or at least it's going to add to his distrust of magic. Which, again, that's that, that's that rugged individualist uh, in him. Trust mm-hmm. no one but yourself. Trust no one but yourself, including all this uh, wacky sorcery out there, which. Ties into Thulsa Doom and his uh, ability to hypnotize. Uh, ties into this scene with the witch. Yeah, and, uh, she said, "You so want to an answer? There's going to be a price to be paid. So it's like a game of Jeopardy." And here we go. Not a bad price, by the way. Yeah, I would pay the price gladly. And it's still talking to him in riddles. Yeah. And being poetic while he's on top of her and just yeah. You get the idea. Pop in the movie, you see where. Yeah, we from are. now on, he will distrust women who talk mm. during sex too. Yeah. <laughs> and yes, you get this in the movie, a sort of sorcery movie. I don't think you'd see it nowadays. Definitely it's a not. Theater. Isn't there? Uh, isn't there some adult stuff in Excalibur? Is Excalibur rated R? Yeah. Oh heck yeah. Yeah, Excalibur's rated there R. There is a history. I remember behind that because. Okay. Yeah, she's the light is changing blue. Looks now like that, a light bulb I have in the that, that 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 looks yeah that definitely mm. looks like a light engine yeah, might and, and she growl yeah that's either some that's either some in camera filter work which mm. would be the old fashioned way to do it but I doubt it it it's looks fine with uh, some uh, filter machines, work in post, yeah. well in post production filter work mm. also but it looks great this animation uh, in this and film he threw her into that fire oh wow. yeah he just tosses her into the fire like yeah go over there um. The animation that we're about to see here uh, is hand drawn, and there's a little bit there's a, there's a little bit more of that uh, later on in the film when uh, Conan is uh, he's out he's when, like when, in a yeah coma. yeah when we when we think he might be dead which again mm. that resurrection uh, death and resurrection yes, that's, resurrection, that's the yeah. low point in the uh, circle but um, the hero the hero's journey circle if you've ever seen that look it up it's cool just just look up heroes uh, hero's journey on uh, wikipedia you'll see it uh, i think i have the book heroes with a thousand faces it's great. I, need to, I need to read it someday it's great um, we see a lot of uh, a lot of hand drawn animation in uh, in this movie uh, that's something else that you don't really see we've seen a return to old fashioned um, Special effects, like in like horror prosthetics films, and we've seen a return to old-fashioned prosthetics, but we haven't seen. And there's a uh, Jerry Lopez. He's a surfer as Subutai. Yeah, yeah Subutai. He's a surfer that Marla has found, and he had no previous acting experience. Right. This is his first movie. So he's not in Big Wednesday. I think. He, I don't know. I don't think. I, he, I, I don't resume. think he, I, he probably isn't. He probably. We'll probably follow up on it a little bit, but, but yeah. But um, we have not seen a return. To old-fashioned visual, special visual effects, uh, that's all. That's all pretty much computerized. I don't think we ever will because too easy to do on a computer. Too easy. It's easier to do. I mean, it's not easy to do on a computer. Not but, easy, but, but it's practical. Maybe it's it's more practical. You mm-hmm. can do more. Um, you can do the impossible because if yeah. you think about movies like Tron or, you know, Lord of the Rings had that good combination of like, a, you know, live action effects and then the computer generated imagery, and um, 
you can just get away with a lot more on a computer. You wouldn't get a Transformers movie if it wasn't for computers. Right. You'd probably have to do stop motion or do all this other stuff. Then you have the RoboCop remake. So I don't know how that turned out. I haven't seen it yet. I, I, me I, either. I kind of want to. I kind of want, want to. to. Okay, yeah, let me know how it turns out. <laughs> Is um, this the way to kill off Murphy's character in the remake? When I heard uh, it, I was like, really? Yeah. Really? The That's another time, debate for another time. <laughs> the last time we got together, we, we were talking about um, what kind of content would you definitely not see in uh, in a movie now. We, we were mainly talking about mature content. Um, in a lot of movies, you just don't see as much. But here's something you definitely don't see in a summer blockbuster. You do not see arguments amongst the uh, amongst the protagonists about religion. Mm-hmm. Um, now, Garrett, now, granted, these are mythic religions that they're talking about, um, made up by you know you know made up by um, the the authors of the film. Mm-hmm. But you're not going to see like philosophical kind of conversations in in this sort of movie. It's just not very I mean, little. You're just not going to see that anymore. And you're talking philosophical, either religion or it's smart political. Stuff. Like uh, Dark Knight, maybe to an extent, but they just throw lines about if you. What is the line about the hero? If you if you live long enough to be the hero, you may die being the villain. Yeah, I'm totally you, misquoting the line. You, I will you, get it straight. You live long enough to see yourself become the villain, and so yeah, like, which is kind of ham-handed. Yeah. It's not it's not nearly as interesting as some of the stuff that uh, Conan and Subutai were talking about just then. And that's what's making this movie so great is this, you have good writers behind this movie with Miles and Stone. So they yeah. can throw this out there and then you have the contrast. And and I think it's I think it's definitely a sign of the culture that that those two guys came from. Mm-hmm. Um they're they're definitely coming from that 60s hippie culture and you don't uh you don't quite get that with these young cats who are making, you know, these these guys they you know, they they may have like, you know, snorted pixie sticks or something when they were kids. That's about it. Yeah. Um you're just not you you just don't have that culture. Uh, we get some bonding here with some great yeah. music over it. Yeah, um, fantastic score. You and, know, you hear us rave about it throughout the movie. Yeah, that uh, there's a there is a three CD version out there. I've got it of the uh, of the Conan the Barbie. You saw it a little while ago. Yeah, and, you uh, have a little it. Trot, I think it put it out. And uh, it's worth getting. There's uh, they don't have uh, they don't have anything really for Destroyer. Uh, mm-hmm. The only version of Destroyer I could find. Was uh, was I think there may have been a CD, but the MP3 download has the same tracks, and it's pretty much pretty much uh, probably you know, condensed. It's, it's, it's condensed, but uh, the expanded Conan the Barbarian score is really something. It's really magnificent. I wonder if I have that one. I have to look and see what I found somewhere. Oh, it's it's a uh, it's definitely <laughs> definitely worth getting. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Uh, Basil Polidaris? Yes. Unfortunately, Mr. Basil Polidaris uh, has Pol- left us. Polidaris. Polidaris. Yeah. Basil Polidaris. Unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago. I can't remember the exact date, but the man has some tremendous scores. Uh, he has missed. He did, he did a few. Yeah, Robocop. Robocop is, had a hell of a five score. The Hunt for Red October had a pretty good score. Yeah. Um, and obviously Conan the Barbarian. And also, he did do the score for Conan the Destroyer, but he did a different theme. I remember that was probably one thing I didn't like the movie. Conan the Destroyer has um, apparently a smaller uh, the 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 score had a smaller budget. Okay. And um, j- just like the the movie, I, I think the movie in general was a little bit scaled down compared to Barbarian. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, I think Conan and Subotai are high in this scene. Yeah, he punches a camel, right? And, uh, he punches a camel. And I'm thinking blazing saddles when he punches a the horse. And there's actually the the guy who gives them the uh, whatever it is they're on. Mm-hmm. He says uh, Stygian or something like that. He mm-hmm. says he says this is the best stuff. That's very uh, <laughs> very uh, Woodstock, shall we say? There are Just references. The best stuff. There are references to good and bad drugs in the middle of a Conan the Barbarian movie, which is you know again very of the time, um, but. But if you're talking about it content hurts. or what would be allowed in the movie, um, and now in a fantasy movie like this, they're gonna go straight PG-13 because Definitely. they need that money. They're trying to appeal to all audiences. The violence will be there, but you're not gonna see the blood or the entry wounds or the exit wounds. They'll probably just cut away as something is happening. What's hilarious is that PG-13 means edgy now because that's yeah. how that's how they get like that's how they get you know. Like the kids to to come in and go like, oh, it's PG thirteen. Means oh, it's edgy. Wow. It's like no, just ah, uh, 
Here Sandal we go. Bergman. Sandal Bergman. My goodness. She was a former model dancer, ballet dancer, I think. I think she, she was. Yeah. She was a dancer. She yeah. was a dancer, yeah. And she's uh, fantastic in this movie. Um, you got a strong female character in this movie. And there's always... There seems to always be some issue when there's a, a female character in the movie that's a strong one that she can wield a sore. She can handle, she can kick ass as well as with the guys, and there's always people arguing, well, pardon me when I say this, like, oh, it's, so, it's a girl with tits that's wielding a sword. It's like, why does it have to be bogged down to that? She happens to be a woman, but she can kick ass with the it's, guys. Like, look, she can be my bodyguard. It's I ain't going to lie. It's easy, to, it's easy to simplify it like that, but, I mean... Not every movie is that simple. This, exactly. th- this this movie may be a an Arnold movie with a, with a bunch of blood and guts in it, but it's a, it's a bit more than that. I mean, you you, you look there's at a, there's more substance. There's to a it. whole lot more substance to this movie than most people would give it credit for. And there's um and and I can definitely see the argument. Well, oh well, they're they're just uh they're just having the woman. Uh, do what a man would do, and she's just and, and what what they're doing is well, just she's they, propping up the men, that right? Way. They, yeah, they get a pretty they get a pretty girl, and they have her play with the boy toys, and I I can definitely see that argument, mm-hmm. and um, I believe that what it really boils down to is we don't have enough women writing, and we don't have enough women directing, not yet, and, still. and not yeah. not yet still, and but uh, you know hopefully hopefully we'll get there. I'm I'm all for you know full on equality across the board, yeah, man. same here, especially and in the arts and. Especially in uh, in big time um, Action productions, movies. yeah, stuff like this. We need that because you have um, when we're talking about especially like uh, female writers or directors, especially do action movies or characters with Divergent and The Hunger Games. Yeah, you're getting a lot of those nowadays, which is good. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but now for female directors, the only thing I can think of is maybe Catherine Bigelow. All right. And who, who's, who is now making propaganda? Who's making US propaganda government. movies? Yeah, <laughs> I did like Zero Dark Thirty. I enjoyed the Hurt Locker. Hurt Locker's all right. You know, she's a, she directed Near Dark, man. Near Dark's it. We man. probably got to talk about that movie. That would be a great one. Near Dark and Point Break. I like Point both Break. Those yeah, movies. I need to watch Point Break. I never again. seen Blue Steel all the way through, but um, I have. Oh, I have Blue Steel. Right? The guy that co-wrote Blue Steel, Eric Red, yes. wrote The Hitcher. Wrote The Hitcher. I like Eric Red. Eric Red. I think he's probably one of my favorite. No, I won't say he's one of my favorite writers, but I've liked a lot of the movies he's written. Definitely, he's uh, he's like a uh, he's like one of those uh, like a, a Sam Fuller or a um, what you call him uh, Howard Hawks. He's he's one of those guys who you know he didn't he was he's in and he's he ran in some old, he ran some legal stuff a few years ago. I think there was some. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, y'all can look that up. We'll Sandal, talk about whatever people say about characters like Valeria, what a lot of people uh, really miss out on is movies tend to be up for interpretation. Uh, my interpretation is that she is Conan's equal. Yes, um, I co-sign on that. She is tough. She's charismatic. She's a thrill seeker. She's more of a thrill seeker than Conan. Even I think Conan plays it kind of straight. There's a giant mm. snake. Yeah, big ass snake, man. <laughs> it probably tastes good, but yeah, it and, it looks good from here. But if I was up close with this, like man, fuck this. And and <laughs> be- between uh, Sandal Bergman in this movie, and then uh, you and you called me on it the other night. I, I did. Uh, well, um, I said, who who before Sandal Bergman? Was uh, was really um, starting that new mold of the female action hero because in the 80s you don't have as much of it. I guess you hardly had a whole lot. If at yeah, all. you had Marion in, uh, you you had Karen Allen in Raiders yeah. who can who can duke it out. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, you said uh, Pam Greer. Pam Greer. Um, I stand by this to this day. I think Pam Greer is one of the first female action heroes. I Definitely. stand by that. Oh yeah. Um, there may have been some before then, if at all, but no, it was Pam Greer. Any old Pam Greer was somebody. Pam Greer could kick your ass and be sexy at the same time. Pam uh-huh. Greer was hot. Yeah, she's still looking good nowadays. Definitely. Now, where are we stealing? Uh, there's some, there's some animated twinkle. Oh yeah, the that, anima- uh, always got an animated twinkle. And there's a, uh, there's the snake, which looks all right for 1982. Yeah, you know, looks okay. Still, still kind of holds up. Some of the effects are a little, uh, a little rinky dink. Mm-hmm. Conan wakes the snake up, he wakes up this with his sweat. Now that's mm-hmm. some crazy shit right there. He's like, I'm going to reach for the jewel. Oh, I'm sweating, and, that, and and the sweat is what wakes the is what wakes the snake up. And it doesn't look is, too bad for 1982 though, because it was a puppet. I mean, uh, so there was a combination. Just all the tricks they had to do to pull off these effects, especially with this big, huge snake. And it looks like he's found the symbol where the snakes are meeting head to head. There it is. Yep, there it See, is. I mean, and Flashback. Again, that, 
you know, just so you don't think that this is just the, the adventures of Conan and it's going nowhere, that's to remind you that, hey, man, uh, he has a goal that he is seeking, that he's striving towards, like any... Uh, Riding 101, get yeah, the hero right, yeah. goal. Yeah. And he's to get paid back on Folds of Doom, pretty much. But yeah, yeah. Not, not, not too bad looking yes, at the it's not looking too bad. It would be mm. CG now. Oh, it would definitely be CG. There now, you go. Right, Look at the puppetry right, right there. there. it looks yeah. a little goofy. But that's all right. Yeah. I mean, you you have to... I mean, th- there are people who will... Kind of snicker at they'll, it. They'll, they'll snicker at that, and they'll snicker at things like Star Trek, and they'll snicker at things like Twilight Zone, and they'll think, oh, that's so cheesy, and they'll roll their eyes um, without really understanding that you know, a story is told within its own limitations, Mm -hmm. always. I mean, that's just how it is. If it's, I mean, reading a story out of a book, you you have a limitation there that it's typed words on paper. Yeah, they're just words on paper. What matters is the story, and sometimes, you know... Um, yeah, I sound like, line with you that. I sound like Ed Wood, but or Johnny Depp is Ed Wood, but suspension mm -hmm. of disbelief. And um, that's the thing with storytelling, is that it's the words on the page, but the story will win out. For instance, if you watch the old Star Trek episodes from the 60s, yeah, they probably had cheesy effects, unless you catch the remastered episodes where they cleaned it up a little bit. So classy. They did good. it classy. They did it classy when they cleaned up the effects. But what I've always told people is that the stories were always strong. Whether it was in 1966 to 2014, if you watch the episode of Star Trek, some people could probably walk away and say, okay, I, I kind of like that. They get past the sets or what have you. But there's still a strong storyline there. At least for the first two seasons of the series, that third season, don't get me started. Hilariously, the woman who was about to be sacrificed begins mm. to scream because the snake has been killed, as if she's been denied some kind of honor, uh, which lets us know, oh yeah, that's right, this is a cult. This is a cult. Um, yes. There's some there's some Jim Jones kind of stuff going on here, and... Doesn't uh, look at Sandal Bergman. Sandal just, Bergman here, getting, uh, Valeria. Oh yeah, getting man. boosted by the rope. Wow. Didn't need Arnold to do it. Arnold it, was already well and gone. She kicks a little bit of ass, and, and she kind and she kind of. Oh well, yeah. That that's that's another theme in this movie. Conan's the kind of guy who would probably prefer to go it alone. Mm-hmm. Uh, he gets his ass saved a couple of times. It, yes. It's it's because of it's because of the the help of others. There there's a little. There's a little bit of a teamwork vibe going on in and this movie. And that's a good point that you bring up is that the teamwork involved in the movie. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember a character's name, Sandow Bergman's character name. I'll probably have to look it up in a little bit. In a Subutai. They B- say Valeria. Him. Valeria, okay. So not, Val- not Belit, who is, Belit. The other, who is the other Conan love mm-hmm. interest, but Valeria. Valeria saves him, and then now they're having a little bit of a, a, little bit of a drink, and then she's trying to get that... Uh, Even in the mythical, mm-hmm. uh, the mythical history of... Uh, Mr. Howard, uh, women love jewelry very much. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's that animated sparkle yeah, again. Animated sparkle I like again. That. Yeah, I, I like it's a nice little touch. Yeah, it uh, it oh, would look smoother now. Yeah, a little tender mommy. He now. is gonna give her, and look at that. Look at the look on her face. He's gonna give her the biggest jewel. It's like that's for you, sign baby. Sign of trust. Yeah, that's a that's a sign of trust. That's a sign of love. And she goes right to bed with him. And I think what I've always liked about this movie, too, is... Good for you, Conan. uh, The diversity in the movie, to an extent. Absolutely. Um, You know, you got Thos of Doom, and I remember Myla's talking about where he could be from, from like an ancient race, but, you know, you have a black character, and Subutai is probably Latino to an extent, and you have a woman character that's his equal. It's a very nice, diverse cast in the movie. That's all I was looking for in the movies I watch. Some of my own own, uh, early stories, when I was a kid, that I would write were very much based on the concept of the caravan that you get from movies like this and movies like Destroyer, where um, you have, you know, your your main dude, and then he gets a sidekick, and then he gets another sidekick, and they go on and on from there. Yeah, I didn't know it at the time, but that's some hero's journey stuff too. That's uh, you know, you get a you get a mentor, you get you know, you get somebody who. Somebody who uh, you know helps you with weapons or gives you some kind of magical you know mystical object or an R two D two or something like that and and Star on Wars and on. G. It's so, almost like a checklist. And I gotta look up that checklist and here we go. We got the prerequisite love scene. So kids who should not be listening to this because we're uh, doing an R rated uh, film. Uh, if you are writing your own stories, uh, you know 
write your own story, but don't be afraid to kind of take a take a look at what's been done before. Definitely. The way I kind of phrase it with that is, um, it's just kind of like when you pick up a flower, a beautiful one. You want to know where you got it from. Damn. And uh, that that was a that was a damn and a. And you got to uh, just know where it came from, like gravity. If you've seen Gravity, not yet. Okay. There's touches of 2001 in just the way the shots and just the style. And the director Alfonso Cuarón was directed, directed was quoted as saying that's one of his favorite movies. It's my favorite movie. The podcast will come sometime in the future. Yeah. It's my mountain of movies. Everybody knows. Oh, this. 2001, definitely. Two, oh, 2001: it's... Space Odyssey, my mountain of movies. I've seen it several times in the theater when they re-release it. She looks good. Oh, she looks great. By the way, uh, speaking of um, telling a story with visuals. With nothing but images, yeah, you know what he just told her because of that little moment. It brings mm-hmm. a tear to your eye, man. I mean, you you know that he just told her the tragedy that uh, that happened to him and mm-hmm. what he went through. She just she cradles him very motherly, by the way. Yeah, that was always touching about the scene. She cradles him, and yeah. they're, they're, this ain't just about she's his equals now. Like this is his lover. Yeah, they're lovers yeah. now. Um. Here's where uh, we get into the debauchery, and mm-hmm. we get into too much success, yep, and getting too fat. much too you getting fat. Too yeah. much success. Watch Wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> I haven't seen that. I want to see that so badly, man. Set um, aside three hours. He <laughs> is uh, he is drunk as a skunk. There, All manner man. of pleasures and diversions. Where wealth can be wealth wonderful. Wealth can be wonderful. Yeah. Yes, it is. Um, but you know, success can test one's metal. And there it is. He, they look so bored. Yeah, bored out of their skulls. <laughs> they, they've watched every every free channel on the Roku box, and they're sick of it, man. Read every book. Every they've channel, read every book, every comic, everything at the buffet you could try out. They 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 went back to vinyl, played a few records backwards, <laughs> resurrected Sammy Kerr's Ghost. Sorry, wrong movie. <laughs> and now they're in trouble because they did it illegally. Because they're thieves. And we love them. Actually, um, I did order the poster uh, a few months ago, the original theatrical one sheet. Oh, Conan? Yeah, Conan oh, the Barbarian. Yeah, man. I think I paid like fifteen or twenty dollars for it. It's it's. Is that Drew Struzan? Uh, it's the poster. I think it is Struzan. It I want to say be. it's Rosetta. Yeah, he did like everybody uh, back yeah. then. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I do have the one sheet poster. It looks pretty good. I'll show you an image of it later on. But I like the tagline. And folks, when if you hear the word tagline for a movie. Oh, we have Max von Sydow here. Here, the movie has another touch of class. class. Yeah, another yeah. Uh, another big time touch of class. Tag, say say that about taglines. Oh, taglines. They're very they're a good way to sell the movie. The most famous ones are for Alien. Alien is in space. No one can hear you scream. Yeah. Uh, Star Trek Two. It was at the end of the universe lies the beginning of vengeance. Oh, that's so good. Blade Runners was man has made his match. Now it's his problem. Yes. Another good one. Now, these are old 80s ones. I don't know about the ones nowadays that kind of just... It's a quote that they're, helps sell the movie. They're just kind of gen- gen- yeah, they're, they're kind of generic now. But what was the one for Conan? Conan was Thief, Warrior, Gladiator, King. That's right. Yeah, because he, yeah. Uh, you do get... And I think that's John Milius right there. I think that I is I think him, that is yeah. a cameo from John Milius. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you do get a glimpse of him as, uh, as King. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, you have this... Because we got King Osric here, you have this uh, this theme of royalty coming up and coming up, and this theme of leadership coming up over and over again with Thulsa Doom. Thulsa Doom's a tyrant. He's a he's a Jim Jones. He's a he's a cult leader, and um, good leadership, bad leadership, all that kind of thing. Um, teamwork versus going solo. Teamwork versus being a tyrant, and on and on. Or in um, uh, let's say briefly, I have to throw my sports in there. <laughs> Go for Teamwork it. versus solo. Uh, the Spurs and Miami Heat. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, everybody was talking about this time when the Spurs redeemed themselves was that it was teamwork. You know, it's the greatest finals performance ever. It was the teamwork versus they went to the individual, which is LeBron James and the Heat. Right. That's probably another discussion for sports because the Heat. They were overmatched, but being biased as a Spurs fan, to say, the Heat were probably a little bit tired, and they didn't have much of a bench to compete because LeBron was having to carry most of the load. They just really didn't have that support system. Absolutely. But partly that into the movie, you're talking about that, right, is 
individualism versus teamwork. Now I'm going to start talking about the finals too. But yeah, well, yeah. I, I noticed that too. They, they played, and I noticed that over the years, mm. they play the best team ball I've ever mm. seen because I, I'll watch when they go into the finals. We're from yeah. San Antonio, right? Mm-hmm. So I'll watch when the when the Spurs when the Spurs are in the playoffs. I'm like, oh well, yeah, why not? Let's check it out. I don't get a yeah. chance to watch a lot of basketball throughout the year, but mm-hmm. when they're in the playoffs, I like to watch, and that's what I notice about they play the best team ball mm-hmm. of of any of those teams every time, and it's 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 a theme that pops up over and over again. And but um, go ahead. No, no. Well, real quickly, and then we'll get back to the movies. That a lot of people were bemoaning how the Spurs were winning their early titles, like supposedly it was ugly basketball, and <laughs> how they slowed down the games they wanted with defense, but they had to change their style as they got older, and just say, yeah, it was a slot team ball, just making the extra pass, sacrificing a shot for a better shot, and just the things you do to help out. Your teammate. So that could probably parlay here in the Conan the Barbarian is that uh, Subutai and Valeria make their own sacrifices in a way to help Conan. Right. And he's all the more thankful for it. Absolutely. And I think that's what's good about the movies that they help, I don't know, prop them up, but they are around them. We've seen several movies where it's just a guy by himself. Probably James Bond to an extent. And he's and a lot of his and, and, and Bond gets Bond gets sidekicks too. He, he does. Has, yeah. He has Felix Leiter. Felix, Felix Leiter, whether it's you know? Bernie Casey or yes. Jeffrey Wright yes. or Bernie Casey. Yes. Yeah, he only did it for one movie. It was the offshoot Never Say Never Again movie. Oh my God, yeah. that's right. Oh, well, that, that's that's when he that's Bernie when, Casey. That's I'm when get he was That's when he wasn't. Uh, you know. T- uh, trying to decide whether or not to allow the you know the the nerds into the tri lounge. I need know. to pop in Revenge of the Nerds. It's its 30th anniversary this year. I watched it last <laughs> night. Oh man! I love it. Here we have uh, well uh, again about Von Sydow. Uh I'm sure some some Jagoff columnist somewhere was saying, oh well here's here's Max von Sydow, you know who who has done such. Fine work in these swe- in these Swedish films with uh, um, um, with uh, Ingmar uh, Bergman and, mm-hmm. and and you know when we know from films like The Exorcist and so on and now he's slumming it doing stuff like this with yeah. this muscle head. I'm sure some schmuck said. Oh that. yeah, yeah, somebody had to in '82, but but it's a great it's 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 he's barely in the movie and it's a really good performance. I think some actors may not get credit when they do these types of movies either. There could be factors like hey, they like the part number one. Pride, they gotta eat too, so yeah. they gotta keep working. Acting's acting. It acting's acting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Act, acting's acting, and um, if the material's good, mm-hmm. then you can make it better through your performance. If the material's bad, you can only do so much. You only do so much. And um, probably this this school of actors, they were actors versus nowadays people probably a little bit more selective. But I remember reading an article about how a lot of primetime actors like Halle Berry, she's won an Oscar. A lot of actors are going to TV now. Yes. Because the material... Woody Harrelson and uh, Matthew McConaughey. Matthew McConaughey. Yeah. Because I think the material TV, they say it's gotten a lot more edgier. And I guess... And, and, mo- and movies, movies are the other way. Yeah, mo- and we movies thought movies were edgier. Movies used to be edgy, and they're not anymore. But probably uh, with TV, they can cut loose a little bit more. You can get a little more edgier content. Last now, time movies were edgy were the, was the indie film boom of the 90s. 90s, that yeah. Was it. Not too much. And, I mean, the, and even that was like kind of... You know, you got the same old shit just about every month. And nowadays, I mean, indie movies, they're still there. They have to fight and scrap to compete. But, I mean, I've I seen my share of NC-17 movies. Uh, um, th- this this film, one of the things that it does well is it um, for a movie about a guy who cuts off heads, um, it makes you care about these characters. Um, she is in love with him. She is, like, smitten with him. She she wants to be with him forever, and uh, it's, uh, trust me, it's a wonderful feeling. She says, uh, "Take the, we, we want to take the world by the throat and make us, uh, make it give us what we desire. Um, and then he leaves. And I think what's the great about this, because he doesn't want her to die. He doesn't want her to die. And, and then and she saves his ass. Yeah, and there you go. And what's good, this last scene that just faded out, um, when she has that look in her eyes, they're communicating through their facial expressions, through emotions. Right. I usually like that type of movie, that type of writing, where I don't need your words to communicate how you feel. I Absolutely. prefer your actions. And she, she's never flat out said, I love you, Conan. I want to be with you. That'd be we cliche. see it in her face. That'd be cliche. And, and mm-hmm. it's, it's uh, the, writing, the, the, the writing is more interesting than that. Well, and if you go to uh, Episode 5 of Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back, Harrison Ford is the type of guy he doesn't like to do a lot of dialogue. I heard you hear him 
and read things where he said, that's too much, I can't do much with this. You remember the famous scene like, where... I can't, I can't mumble through this. Yeah, I can't mumble through this. So <laughs> I'm just going to say, I know you love me, Leia. I mean, that's not the exact line. She says, I love you. Harrison Ford's like, I know. And I think there's more it was, to it. It was going to be something like, just remember that because mm-hmm. I'll be back. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's in the novelization, too. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, he just changed it to I know, which, you know, mm-hmm. you look back on it now and it's like... Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, he's cocky. Yeah, that but guy's heavy, man. You yeah, know. And, you know, some actors got very good instincts, and you have to realize what goes into the movies is actors will make up stuff on the fly. If you read about the improv- improvisation of what they do, uh, it's just it's just truly remarkable. But that's me and Forrest, and probably a lot of aficionados that watch these documentaries, read Wikipedia, and just get all this movie trivia, but that's what's so great about it. It's like, how do they come up with this stuff to make the movie to us that hits us home in some sort of fashion. The, uh, the, uh, the printing press and the internet, man. I mean, awesome. the, the, the printing press, the movie camera, radio, television, the internet. I mean, we... we Fires can, the imagination we, up. We, yeah, you, you, can, you, can use these, you can use these tools to learn, mm-hmm. or you can use these tools to tell everybody what you're doing. And you know what? I, I'd rather, I'd rather, I'd rather use them to learn. To learn, yeah. I don't want to tell have, everybody. Have we gotten to the hippies yet? Yeah, no. Because um, I got right a feeling that John Milius doesn't like hippies. Because all of those oh, that's are, later on in the movie. Then that guy that was trying to hit on followers are yeah. are really mellow, man. They're uh, they're pretty. And then, then they run to a character that's kind of, I guess, kind of effeminate or whatever. That oh, was checking out that Conan. too. Yeah, we'll yeah, get to that. Like, yeah, yeah, we'll get to that in a little bit. Is this Mako? Uh, I have a wizard, mind you. Is Giants that this? Guides. Is that yeah. those Giants guides? Once, but long ago. Oh, I think he's. This is narration right now. Yeah. So that is Mako, technically, because he's he's the narrator. Yes, here he is. Okay, mm-hmm. so another excellent performance, and uh, yeah, Mako's Asian. So that back to the diversity of the movie, and he's so good in this that um, they bring him back in the second one. He's I think he's the only character who comes back in the second one. Wasn't uh, Subutai in the second one? No. He was not. Okay, he's not, so he's not in... Uh, There's Mako. There he is. There he is. Ha, uh, Hakiro, I, mm-hmm. believe is, uh, I believe his name is. Yeah, Hakiro. I heard the second one financially did fine. It just oh, wasn't yeah. received it well. Wasn't it didn't flop. bomb. It just, it was, uh, it just wasn't received people well. People don't like it as much as they like this one. And I, you know, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> he has a fantastic voice. That dude... And then he just starts cackling. Like, he points at him like, ah, I got you. Hey, I, I was about to totally send your ass to hell. And now, uh, nah, get your ass over here. Come on, hang out. And now by the ocean. <laughs> nice sunset. Always nice to capture those on film. In, uh, in Campbell's studies, he found that the hero will gain weapons, join with allies, gain, ment- uh, gain mentors, uh, defeat guardians, cross thresholds, face a low point, a dark night of the soul, which we get to later. All of these things happen here, um, again, because the secret was out that Lucas was a Campbell freak and everyone in Hollywood was trying to turn out the next Star Wars. So you get tons of movies that follow this formula, even to this day. Uh, and, the and Avengers then, have their low point when um, what's-his-name dies, uh, who doesn't really die because they gave him a TV show. Agent oh, the Coulson. Car- Agent they Coulson, had pins yeah. that say Agent Coulson. I'm like, yeah. I'm trying to remember the actor's name. I remember he was on that show, uh, The Old Adventures of New Christine. He played her ex-husband oh, on the okay, show or something okay. like that. Yeah, I can't think of the actor's name. There's a lot I can't think of. I probably have to fire up the computer, so... I like to back up my facts and just say, "Whoa, what was his name?" <laughs> you know, I do want to try and back it up, ladies well, and gentlemen. Well, I don't. I, I don't have the encyclopedic yeah, knowledge <laughs> that I used to have at 27, because now I'm 37, and <laughs> that sort of thing happens to your. Brain. It's all good. Um, Shoot, we're doing good. We're still talking about Conan. You know, all yeah. the facts we're spewing about this movie. I mean, heck, we know the names of the actors in this movie. Some people are like, uh, I just know Arnold Schwarzenegger. I don't know Sandal Bergman or uh, Jerry Lopez that plays yeah. Super Tie. We're mentioning the music composer in the movie, the director. So yeah, <laughs> let's talk fun. about the cinematography in the movie. Um, ah, here he goes. Is this the camp? Or here's here's the hippie camp. Here's the hippie camp. Um, okay. Which I mean, tense and all, man. Mm-hmm. This that's that's what this is meant to evoke. Make mm-hmm. no mistake. Yeah, and look how they kind of like flowers, flowers, yeah, and then uh, amen. they they were in hoods and they kind of like and they're singing doom, 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 doom like yeah, that, or chanting doom, doom, doom. Oh yeah. You got a guy with a rock on his head and two mm-hmm. rocks in his hands, like the uh, crystal worshippers of the time. 
um, big movies like this tend to be an exercise in uh, wish fulfillment. We want Conan to win. Uh, what this movie, probably because of its R rating, does better than its peers is it presents pulpy material, wish fulfillment material, with a sense of maturity, with intelligence, with introspection. Um, yeah, it's not tongue in cheek. It's just it's yeah. a right. It's it's, um, it's not winking at you. It's not winking at you. Yeah. yeah. Not, well, a little bit, I guess, because there's hippies. But would you say vermicellitude to an extent? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. And it, it, it's it's for a dumb movie. It's real smart. Mm hmm. Yeah. And you got the writers to back it. It's kind of like that was the term uh, Richard Donner used when he was making the first Superman movie. Say vermicellitude because yeah. he he butted heads with the producers about the tone of the movie. If he didn't stand his ground. You get a Superman the movie that would have looked like Superman three, probably. Ooh, yeah. That's what they were talking about, and or worse yet, yeah, Superman, Superman four. <laughs> well, the producers had long vacated the series at that point. Just yeah, Can Cannon was trying to make a Superman movie for ten bucks when this movie needed to be made for yeah. fifty million dollars. You can't do that. You can't go cheap on a franchise like that. Group think, group think. Mm -hmm. um, Conan. Okay, here's the, yeah, here's the guy. Conan. Kinda. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. There, there's that too, which, uh, that, yeah, Conan meets a uh, a follower. Yeah, I guess, a really. follower of Set, a follower of Thulsa Doom. And he's like opening who, up his chest. Uh, yeah, seems too bad for the other team, which is yeah. a, which is a bit much. Uh, not probably wouldn't be played like this now. Um, you you probably would not have uh, Conan kick the guy's ass, you know, simply because the audience at the time mm -hmm. is thinking, you know, yeah, kick that guy's ass. He's mm -hmm. he's 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 not like me. He's not like you. Um, he's got that look like mm. yeah, pro yeah, he's 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 checking I can get him into a corner. He's checking all yeah. out. He's checking all out. But you would you wouldn't have that now and then that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, because remember like with Braveheart, uh do you remember uh, what was it the king's son had his lover oh, and then he threw him out? Shit. God, I haven't seen that movie in so long, but yeah, I think I remember that. And I think there was probably a little bit of a controversy about that and how it could be saying, oh, it's... Braveheart's pretty late in the game, man. That's like 93. 95, that's 11, yeah. That's, a, that's 11 years, 12 years after this, so... Yeah, it was, uh, uh, came out in 95, won five Oscars, including Best Picture. Yeah. Beat out Babe and um, Apollo 13 that year. Yeah. What this scene does, you know, other than that part, what, what this scene does a whole lot better is it gets into the idea of groupthink, which uh, is an issue no matter uh, what the belief. Mm -hmm. If you've got people who just want to join the club, well, they're not really thinking for themselves. And uh, Conan is the kind of guy, and Milius is the kind of guy, and Oliver Stone and Robert E. Howard, these are, these are people who definitely, definitely, definitely think for themselves. And um, that's something that... Individual, yeah, it's, it's individual individualistic, choice. and yeah. I guess maybe that would pop up in a movie now and then. Now I, it, it probably has, um, but that's what cults specialize in. Uh, whether that cult is the cult of Set or the, uh, the, the cult, cult of Twitter, uh, <laughs> you know? oh yeah, if you getting those, yeah, cult of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Facebook. Sports cults to an extent. We went from the me generation to the me 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 generation. Mm -hmm. Um. Heck, cults of like Star Trek or uh, Star Wars to an extent. S Star Trek very briefly touched about like let's say the cult of it. You have some fans that just do not like the new movies because they felt like oh they're they're blockbuster friendly and yeah. it's not what Star Trek is about. Versus some people saying hey, if Star Trek was going to be viable in 2014 and this generation, it's going to have to pump it up a little. And you know they're saying no, you're not a true Trek fan if you like this. Michael Bay inspired Star Trek. People have said that about the remake of Conan, also mm. that it's that um, they've actually uh, some people actually said that it's closer to the original material mm -hmm. than uh, than uh, this movie is. But I I wouldn't know. I would and we gotta see how how the movie is though. If the Ron movie's Perlman's bad, in it, yeah, Ron Perlman. It's got that going for it. Hey, he was in Pacific Rim also. I like that one. <laughs> I like Pacific <laughs> Rim. And then after I saw Godzilla, I'm starting to get into those monster movies, like the big monster movies. Um. Arnold's about to get uh, captured. He's wearing the bad guy's uniform, uh, which might, uh, w which isn't just a nod to Star Wars. That kind of thing's been done in, uh, oh, in old stories. I mean, heck, yeah, Blazing Saddles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if we want to go a very comedic route, well, Blazing uh, Saddles. <laughs> definitely Blazing Saddles, but also uh, even stuff like The Odyssey, 
mm-hmm. where where the uh, where the heroes hide mm-hmm. underneath the sheep. Yeah. Or the la- uh, it's, it's a, a big ass sheep, I guess. But oh, they're man. they're they're hiding, or is it an ox? I forget. But mm-hmm. uh, they're trying to get past the cyclops, and they're 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 grasping on to, to this thing, and they're mm-hmm. and they're hiding underneath it. Uh, to get past them. Got to so, read the Odyssey, folks. Oh, yeah. I almost say it's one of the cradles of literature. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't read it in a while, though, but, uh, yeah, awesome oh, yeah. novel. You probably have to read it once every year just to get the feel for it. This is uh, King Osric's daughter right here. Yeah, yeah who, that's um, a, who is the Patty Hearst of the film, right? So yeah. So, we're, again, we're, we're going she's into... She's pretty much brainwashed and what have Yeah, you. she's... she's uh, and that, that sort of thing pops up in Escape from L.A., Mm-hmm. Yes, the with uh, president's the president's daughter, daughter. Yeah. who is uh, also uh, wearing uh, lingerie and so on. Mm-hmm. It also pops up in a John Waters film called Cecil B. Demented. Cecil B. Demented with Melanie Griffith. Melanie character. Griffith. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the best John Waters movie by any stretch. I need but to catch up on some John Waters, it's like Pink Flamingos funny. or something Pink like Flam- that. Pink Flamingos, uh, if, if, you like, if you like really trashy, if you can sit through really trashy movies that look like they were shot through a cheese grater, man. They're so funny. They're, they're really funny because it's all amateur <laughs> actors. And, okay. they're, and they're all they're all really hamming it up and having mm-hmm. a blast. But um, Conan's about to get caught here. Infidel, they say. Um, and he's, uh, he's What caught. triggered it once again? That they caught him? I'm trying to see here. How did they... I, how did they know he was an infidel? I, or didn't, just... catch, I didn't catch how they, okay. uh, how they figured that out. And he don't look like hoodsman to a way. Oh like well, yeah. Clansman or whatever. And I think, um, well, Quentin Tarantino likes revenge films a lot. That's his and, pattern, and, yeah. and that, that's that's one of that's one of his things. That's why Kill Bill, um, you know, and Kill John Bill Wayne has Jane. that. Yeah. Uh, and well, in 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 Django, there's mm. there's a scene actually very much like this with with some kind of proto clansman. Types <laughs> when they were trying to go after uh, and, Jamie Foxx's and, character and, compl- and complaining about how they can't that was see crazy and they're cussing each other out over over it really yeah. funny stuff it was man. a funny scene I remember in the theater everybody busts out laughing and oh it's great John Johnson puts a head on like man I can't see fucking shit out Jonah, of this thing Jonah Hill uh, who who you know yeah I, I this, wasn't the biggest fan of I, I saw him in that and I thought oh well dude now okay um, yeah I'm, he's a two time cool. Oscar nominee now I was like so this guy can act really. He's I'm thinking right. super bad, and then now um, he's a he's a bona fide actor. Tulsa Doom speech, the riddle is yes. Steel. We're, um, we get into we, again, we get into more philosophy that um, steel is not strong. It's flesh. That flesh is stronger. You can because control people because it's flesh, and it's flesh that wields the steel. All mm-hmm. right, that's not not the Rolling Stones album. But, <laughs> um, it's. One of my favorite speeches in movies. It's uh, it's, and it's 1982. Mm-hmm. There's James Earl Jones and there's Ricardo Montalban in Wrath of Khan. Wrath of Khan. Yeah. Um, well, what's a good speech from his? Uh, oh God. What? Well, he's he's quoting he's quoting Moby Dick Moby most Dick. of the time. So it's just that. Well, probably that part when he's noticing the Empire, Enterprise. I've always said this. It reminds me of Moby Dick. He says, "There she is." There yes. she is. <laughs> Not so wounded as we were led to believe. Um, so much the better. There's um. You in movies, my in the smarter, in the smarter action films of the time, the high quality stuff like this, like Wrath of Khan, like Empire Strikes Back, um, like um, Raiders of Lost Ark, mm-hmm. um, like uh, you're you're just a shadowy reflection of me, Indiana, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. There's less mustache twisting from your bad guys. That's true, and probably like Walter Hill movies are just a lot of those action yeah. flicks where like there's a lot of back and forth, like maybe heat to an extent. Yeah, with uh, Al Pacino, oh, Rob De Niro, yeah, like they admired one another from a distance. Then they had the diner scene that um, Al Pacino was obsessive after De Niro. De Niro was kind of into him a little bit, but they respect each other in some way. But they were still on opposite sides of the law. Character, and yeah, character. It's, it's about character. It's, it's, it's the it's the reason that the Wild Bunch resonates yeah. ugly. It's it's the reason that those movies. Um, still work. Still work. Mm-hmm. It's the reason that they develop a cult following. Even the ones that don't do as well in the theater, mm-hmm. they develop. A cult. Boy, that, that is, is power. Yes. He just tells the girl, "Come down." She just like falls into a, like a little wooden floor, and then yeah, that is herself. a that is a dick move. Yeah, come girl. It's like, hey, she, she just sacrificed the fall through some all wood. All she did was hang out. She wanted the party, and mm-hmm. you like said, you know, hey, this way. And you got James Earl Jones. Only he could bring this character to life with a great wig, great fucking wig, fantastic wig. <laughs> We're about to get some um, 
torture or things. Yeah, and some pre- uh, uh, once again, uh, some pretty heavy duty. Crucify him. Yeah, yeah, crucify him. Tree of woe. Some pretty heavy duty symbolism, mm-hmm. lo- just like the wheel of pain. Um, Tree of woe. He's it crucified. Is, it's the Nietzsche quote. It's that. It's that Nietzsche quote that opens the film. Uh, that which does not kill us only makes us stronger. And uh, Arnold uh, just about keels over in this. I, mm-hmm. I love the bit with the vulture. Um, yeah, might, yeah, we'll get to that part in a little bit. And when uh, when he is and, and sorry, I'm not I'm not going to worry too much about spoilers here because mm-hmm. if. If you haven't seen the movie, well, then you shouldn't be listening to this. Very true. See, yeah, we can cut away on it. Yeah, there's the vulture then. When when Subotai shows up at the mm. end of the scene, the, the, I love I love uh, Arnold's laugh. It's mm. it's great. He's <laughs> like, ha, 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 and he just passes out. Um, however you feel about uh, that belief, which might be a little too simplistic. If it doesn't kill us, it makes us stronger. Well, you know, maybe or not. Um, it makes for good storytelling. Mm-hmm. Um, put your hero through, put your hero through the ringer. If he survives it, okay. If that didn't kill him, sometimes that's gonna make it stronger. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we create, uh, sometimes we create myths so mm-hmm. that we, you know, perhaps for people who don't have a philosophy, mm-hmm. maybe somebody got something out of this. Maybe somebody watched this a few times and, and looked at that quote and said. Man, okay, if Con- you know it's 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 Book of Job kind of stuff, but you know, hey, if if if, if Conan went through that, all right, well, maybe I can find a, a better job than this, or maybe I can exactly. And that this is just the movie we're talking about. Oh, but this is the power of my car, big yeah. deal, you know. But not when we say not just the movie to poo poo it, but <laughs> why we're into movies so much nowadays, and people I think are finally getting in touch with that inner geek or that inner film fan that they probably didn't think was cool or ever have you and i have always been like that we we know our love of movies we we got the power of movies yeah you, like you talked about you watch conan what he goes through it can inspire some people and you it, get it in two hours instead of instead of uh, a full season of a tv series although mm-hmm. you, you can get a lot out of you can get a, a lot out of a season of doctor who there's some yeah. great stuff in there there's some mm-hmm. great stuff in breaking bad yeah um but i think movies uh movies just my, yeah there's his laugh <laughs> <laughs> Done. Oh no, he's still going. I remember watching one of the deleted scenes. I think it was when he was running away from the dogs, just climbing up the mountain. He fell. He was like, oh god damn it! Poor guy. Yeah, it was like um, one of the live takes. <laughs> this uh, this scene, re- I-, I love that you think that Subotai is an illusion for a second there, mm-hmm. and then oh no, that's real. He's coming to he's coming to save he's his coming body, to save you, man, which is beautiful. And then and then there's Sandal Bergman. Speaking of, um, very 80s headband going on there. Uh, those came back into style briefly for a while there, a couple years Shoot, ago. Shoot, kind of like uh, the shirts from Flashdance. Oh, Jesus, God. I all. couldn't believe it when I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> I, when I saw chicks with the, the one shoulder strap down, I said, you, you have got to be... <laughs> oh, like nowadays? Like or a few you years ago. A few years ago. Like, yeah, I've it made a little that. comeback, I've didn't it? it? Yeah. yeah. Um, that scene reminds me of The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly mm-hmm. a lot. That scene with Conan tied to the Tree of Woe reminds me quite a bit... Of uh, Clint Eastwood going through the desert. Oh yeah, when uh, oh yeah, oh yeah. And speaking of which, uh, Eli Wallach passed away a few uh, two or three weeks ago. Eli Ninety-two, Wallet. I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, a good life. Good life. A yeah. Good you life. lived that long and still and have a, a career in that industry. A very, very influential. Very influential actor uh, from from movies like uh, Baby Doll to mm-hmm. you know just everything else. Fantastic. Method actor. Method actor. Fantastic. Um, but yeah, now the part when uh, Clint Eastwood's character gets dragged through the desert, then yeah. then that carriage comes through, and then you had that the great rise of the horns from Ennio Morricone's oh, score. Oh yeah, and uh, <laughs> then information gets relayed. Someone has a piece of information that the other doesn't have to right. find the gold. But see, uh, it, it it serves that kind of stuff, and and the same thing applies here. Scenes like that serve. Uh, to further the plot, of course, mm-hmm. and some people will tell you that the plot is king. Some people will tell you that the, the ca- that character is king. Either way, doesn't matter. It um, it keeps character going too. Mm-hmm. It it moves the characters forward as well. And we need to see our heroes transcend their own weaknesses. Mm-hmm. Uh, we need to see them fail. Otherwise, there's no suspense. There's, there's no, no suspense. Story. Yeah, we want to see them just fall. Uh, let's think of some examples. Luke Skywalker, his fall. Yeah, that's Luke Skywalker. I his hand gets cut off. His hand gets cut off. He finds out his daddy is like the the most ruthless person in the freaking universe, 
but then in Return of the Jedi, he gets paid back, but then there was a cost that he almost tiptoed at. I was I was even thinking of just... Uh, or you know, Rock, oh, all, all Rocky those. got the shit beat out of him in Rocky Three yeah. by uh, Mr. T. <laughs> I, mean, um, I, I think of Mr. T, and I think mm. of, like, Saturday night's main event where me and, <laughs> me and Gene is interrupting his workout. Mm-hmm. Get out of here, fool! <laughs> um, but um, I was thinking of Luke uh, being unable to get his ship out of the water. Yeah. And uh, yeah, probably before you got Yoda, Yoda, yeah. Yoda telling him, uh, Luke, Yoda gets it out, and Luke says, "I, I don't believe it." And mm-hmm. Yoda says, so that's, "That's why you fail. That's why you fail because you don't believe." Here we go. Okay, uh, the spirit. You gotta believe in yourself. Here, here is some more uh, animation, animation from the from the time period. It's hand drawn. I think it looks beautiful. It's serviceable. It does just what it needs to. do. Um, yeah, I, I, I uh, to me, I mean, that's hand drawn and it looks painted. And mm-hmm. of course, it's not really there. It's not necessarily meant to look like it's really there. These are spirits. How are they going to look? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's meant to look like mm-hmm. what it is. It's. I mean, it, if they can you imagine if they had done that with puppets on rods? It would have oh, looked. Oh gosh! It would have looked horrible. shitty. To say it would have yeah. yeah. been the worst. If it were done now, of course, it would be CG and it would look. It would look great. I it mean, would look really un- good unless it was like a Sci-Fi Channel movie of the week or something. Oh gosh, no. Valeria. Yeah. And, and they're probably using a filter. This one, I don't know if this is in camera too. Well, and the, the spirits look a little bit wicked on there. They look for, cool. Well, for, they, they look like a, they look like heavy metal album cover <laughs> stuff, man, from the time. Um, has she already told Mako? Um, do the gods Hakiro, have a price? Yeah, yeah. About that the was price. Her, I was looking at earlier. Yeah, do the gods have a price? Yeah. Or, um, or do I, do you owe the gods any? Or do I owe the gods any favors? Or do you owe the gods any favors? She. Uh, Either way, she does make the ultimate sacrifice, uh, and she does it to save the man she loves. Mm-hmm. Um, the gods, or fate, or the storyteller, um, spoiler, whatever, will eventually take her life. And mm-hmm. that's going to remind Conan that there's always a price. Yep. Always a price. At nice. least if we're talking irony and, and, and you know storytelling mm-hmm. and so on. Nothing's guaranteed in life, or there's always a price for life. There's a price for that living. Uh, he's the kind of guy again. He who prefers to work alone, uh, straight out of those oil fields that uh, Robert E. Howard's. Uh, you know that, that that when Robert E. Howard living in Texas mm-hmm. would. You know he's he's living near these oil fields and he talked to these these uh, these roughneck guys mm-hmm. and these guys were all th- like that's the kind of attitude that they had. So a lot of go that, at it on a, your own. A lot of that goes into goes into Conan. Um, but uh, in the best stories, uh, character spurs action, and those actions have consequences. Uh, Conan's hatred of Thulsa Doom drives uh, him. We, yeah, it drives him, but we also get the feeling, especially in a few minutes when he wakes up, yeah, there he is, uh, there's a moment where um, Subotai can't get a final word from Conan mm-hmm. about... Uh, about hey man, we're just there to rescue the princess. Mm-hmm. We're not there for revenge. We're just mm-hmm. you know, Rambo, you're just there to take photographs, yes. right? It's First love part is like, just take photographs. Photographs, you know. I sprung out of prison like hey, shoot. Um, let me shoot some wildlife. He'll get he me out of this hellhole. <laughs> yeah. He can't get a straight answer out of Conan though about mm-hmm. that. Conan just keeps sharpening his sword. Like nah, we already know what he's what he's there yeah. for. But that has a consequence. Uh, that's that's the scene coming up here where Valeria uh, is uh, no longer with us. Um, we get the feeling ahead of that ahead of that though that it is going that his attitude here, his quest for revenge, his uh, bloodlust is going to cause more trouble than it's actually worth. But he hasn't learned that lesson yet. He has to learn that lesson in order to become the much wiser Conan. Who we see at the end of the film, sitting on a throne with a, you know, with silly, a, silly, silly, ridiculous beard. beard or, you know, is it a fake beard? beard or? Probably is. I mean, I've never seen Schwarzenegger bearded out. I mean, we can Running Man zoom in on it. Yeah, Running Man. That's right. <laughs> One of my favorites. I love that movie. Stephen King novel or novella. Um, yeah, Stephen King. Under different pen name. He did, uh, right? Richard, Richard Bachman. Yeah. So, 
Good Arnold, bad Arnold, huh? Um, good Arnold. This is a good Arnold. This is good Arnold. What's Running Man is good Arnold. Like I said, he did some of the best sci-fi flicks of the last Predator. 20 or 30 years. Predator. Everybody talks about Predator, and that's another one that... Uh, they came out the same year, I think, within two or three months of each other. Running Man yeah. and uh, Predator. Now here's the scene I was talking about a minute mm-hmm. ago, but um, where he's, he just so keeps these could do that, but not that sword. Yeah. yeah. But... Um, yeah, he ain't saying a damn thing. Look at that. Only the girl. We killed Thil some Doom another day. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, the mission was from King Osiris is to rescue his daughter. Right. Not go on some side thing and yeah. kill Thil some Doom. But some people are like, well, two birds, one stone. You know, well. Conan's got a little Charlie Bronson in him. He's going to go do his own thing. He's got mm-hmm. some Clint Eastwood in him, you know. But, um. Predator. That's one that a lot of people still like. I mean, I, it's that's, still pretty good. I saw it at the drive-in. Technically, when it came out in theaters, I think I caught the tail end of it because I was watching another movie in the theater. And I think my dad was watching Predator. Uh, was it Inner Space or Harry and the Hendersons? I don't know. What I was seeing in the theater, and I came at the tail. Yeah, I came on the tail end of Predator uh, or Beverly Hills Cop Two once again, folks. I was eight years old. When I saw Beverly Hills Cop Two in the theater. <laughs> Twice, I think. And, and better for it. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I need to watch uh, Beverly Hills Cop 2 again. It's been a hot minute since I've seen it. Probably um, about 15, 20, no, probably 20 years. But that that's, you know, that's another one where it's not just an Arnold movie. It's, mm-hmm. it really, it, just like Conan the Barbarian, it's Arnold and Pals. Yeah. Um, he's got, he's got a, he's got a lot of other actors to work with. Even mm-hmm. Jesse Ventura turns in a good performance. Oh, heck yeah, that was a good oh, ensemble in Ventura, Predator. Yeah, it's a great, uh, Ventura, Shane Black? Shane Black. Shane Black? The it? writer of Lethal Weapon, guys. <laughs> If you don't know who Shane Black is in the movie, he's the one that with has the glasses. a joke. With the glasses. And he has a joke about, you know, geez, you got a big pussy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the echo joke. Yeah, yeah. and uh, there's a lot of funny lines in Predator. What was the one about, oh, they got their war paint on. Yeah, here comes the tragedy in a little bit. But, yeah, what was the what was the line about, uh, he, tells, he tells Billy, Sonny Landham, yeah. uh, the Indian character, uh, Billy, get us out of this shithole. And Billy's like, well, we should go here, we should go here. But it's like, I wouldn't go there because I want to wish down a broke dick dog. Or <laughs> the one with Jason Ventura said when he's trying to feed everybody the tobacco. He's like, man, we got some slack, Joe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that, yeah. Um, I was like, that movie. Testosterone to a T in the oh, 80s. Be, oh, huge. Um, and that, you know, that kind of thing is very much. That's some crushing testosterone back in the Oh, 80s. God. Ri- ridiculous. You, you got a whole lot of. And it, if you watch wrestling from that mm-hmm. time. Uh, the, like some of the dialogue in Predator sounds yeah. exactly like some of the stuff that you would hear wrestlers say to each other on yeah. the microphone, like "Take the Snake Roberts, you're going down, and I'm yeah. taking Damien too with me," you know, and on and on and on. <laughs> but um, when you put Arnold with a good supporting cast, you do tend to get a better you Arnold get a better movie. out of him. Um, yeah, Terminator. Arnold is... Um, Which part is this? Is this the pit, right? With yeah. the cannibals? Yeah. Because I remember when I watched this a few months ago, I was like, wait a minute, are those body parts? <laughs> the legs by themselves? Ar- Ar- Arnold's mm. essentially the star of Terminator. I mean, mm. you watch that movie because Arnold's in it, but man, Michael Bean, Linda Hamilton, it's mm. got a uh, to fucking... Even Bill Paxton. In Bill the Paxton. Uh, uh, Lance Henriksen. Who Lance Henriksen. Pl- who, uh, if you check out James Paul Cameron's Winfield. sketches, Paul, the late Paul Winfield. Paul Winfield. Yeah. The original Cameron sketches have... Yeah. Have this really T one thousand looking version, mm-hmm. yeah. What would eventually kind of find its way into the Robert Patrick, role. the Patrick character, but, but then he, also he's, yeah. he's drawn to look like Lance Henriksen originally. But if you put if you put Arnold Running Man again, mm-hmm. if you put him with a good supporting cast, he does a great job. If you put him with you know some flavor of the month TV star or whatever, I mean, he has not, some problems. Not nothing against uh, nothing against like Johnny Knoxville. I mean, mm-hmm. I haven't seen that one with him in Knoxville. The Last Stand, yeah, yeah, Last Stand. Boris Whitaker, I think, is in that also. Oh, I like him. See, so you you put you put Arnold with a good supporting cast, you get good results. Um, Eraser had a good supporting cast. Vanessa Williams, good, yeah. I think that's when she was just catching on. Yeah. She was getting big at that point. She James done, Cromwell. Uh, James, James Con. Cromwell's a James bad Con guy. In it, yeah. Yeah. Or uh, James Con. James Con. James Cromwell was the one that was on to Vanessa yes. Williams, and he like sh- he shoots himself in the head. Then all of a sudden, they oh blast the window God. open, and this like big old gush of wind comes. It's like, well, if you have, have to have a dramatic death scene, oh, the orgy scene. This is an <laughs> orgy, and it's and this this music cue comes up again in mm. Conan the Destroyer. Of course, ah. the the orgy music cue pops mm. up again. But um, yeah, we're we're back to debauchery. Uh, Conan and his buddies have already kind of learned the lesson that if you have too much success, you get fat and you get bloated. 
Um, False of Doom uh, perhaps does not know that. And there's a, there's my cat right there. Wow. Uh, one of my mm. cats. But uh, big ass cat. Yeah. That's a big <laughs> one, <man. laughs> but you have uh, you have this kind of uh, Bob Guccione. Uh, well, what, what's that damn movie with Malcolm McDowell? Uh, Caligula type of... Uh, Haven't seen it. Heard of it yet. either. Yeah. But, um, you have this Caligula type of uh, orgy scene, which isn't nearly <laughs> as... Uh, that That is some gross-looking soup. Yeah, it has some gross-looking soup. So soup. this Man is... Soup, if you want I, I love yeah. that. I love that. He, he brings up this split-pea-looking soup, and then Subotai goes, so this is paradise. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, pea-looking soup with hands, like severed hands, is like part of the ingredients. Did Valeria yeah. already tell Conan that uh, she would come back from yeah, we, the dead? Yeah, yeah, I would still come back from the dead and fight by your side. So we know. Yeah. She, so we know she's worm bait. I mean, that mm-hmm. that that is not something you say in a film unless you're worm bait, right? Mm-hmm. It's a beautiful promise, though. Here we go. We got cutaways of James Earl Jones. We had a face to face and a close up. A lot of edits. There's He's a got jump the contact lens. Dive jump cut. There's a jump cut there, and it actually looks neat. And He's got the eye, the contact lenses of the snake. And you still hear the orgy music. I do believe that snakes get a bum rap. And they're very now morphing. They're still very they're very valuable to the food chain. But mm-hmm. um, again, just like the Nietzsche thing, great for symbolism. Yep. Great for imagery. The snake is uh, it's danger, it's lust, Here you it's go. Uh, sneakiness, and it's a stand-in for our own fears. Now, what do you think about this morphing scene where like his bones are extending to like form the head of a snake? Okay, for 1982. Yeah, it's I, convincing enough. I really like when his when the transformation has already taken place. Yeah. And, yeah, it's coming up here in a bit where it's just the snake head. Mm-hmm. And that actually looks pretty good. Yeah, right there. there. That looks cool. That, that does look awesome. Is this the snake head? And I, I still think, got the costume on. I think I had a He-Man action figure that looked just like that, actually. I wonder how much those figures go for. Probably uh, a chunk of money. The snake makes for cool tattoos and theme park rides. Uh, <laughs> now they will know why they are afraid of the dark, why they fear the night. Uh, all of that kind of stuff, man. That's an interesting war paint they have on there, just with the black streaks. Almost tribal in a way. It, looks, uh, it looks like camouflage, but mm-hmm. uh, kind of like sand mm-hmm. uh, camouflage. Yeah, it looks good. Got to go undercover at night here. And see, Sandal Bergman's character, she's the one that's initiating a lot of the action in her Absolutely. own way. Absolutely. She's not waiting. No. She, she does this on her own. She's got, the sp- she's got that spirit of adventure because she's used to being off on her own. Mm-hmm. Um, when, it's, when it's a man's game, who's going to take a woman seriously, right? So she's out there. She's got to kick ass on her own. ass on her own. And that's back to that theme we, were, uh, we, are, we brought out through the, the cast here is about individuality. Yeah. A lot of these characters can take care of themselves, but what that that's what make it, that that's what makes it unique is how they take. There's that super game with the hands. <laughs> what makes it unique is that they can stand on their own, but they're they're badass when they stand together, and you know they just put all their unique talents together. Because I think uh, Subutai's weapon, he doesn't have a sword. He's using the bows. He's right? using a bow. He's using bow and arrow. He's using yeah. bow and arrows. Yeah. Well, the, that's uh. When you have a uh, mm-hmm. that dude's ugly. There you go. When you have his throat. Oh, that Bam. is gross looking. Oh, and then that green crap. Jesus, yeah. Uh. Here we go. We're getting we're, into the action. We're, on wa- here. we're watching this with the subtitles on, mm-hmm. so we don't hear grunting uh, and groaning so while she slashes away, cuts oh, off a dude's head. You man. forgot about that, didn't you? You watched this a few weeks ago. There's now. so much great stuff in this. Told you, gleefully brutal, gleefully brutal, and. uh... Lord of the Rings doesn't have any of this. No, the um, Hobbit certainly doesn't have any of this. It's a chore to get to the first Hobbit movie. Yeah, it is. I don't know how much longer the extended version is. And this but, um, movie's over two hours long. It's, it's about, like two hours. It's and nine about minutes, two hours. Yeah, it, it's it's a little over two hours long, but it goes by fast. Even yep. this extended cut really does go by fast. Look at the bloodletting in this movie, man. Throats getting slit. We can get some of these old school movies nowadays. I mean, yeah, yeah, Gladiator and probably Braveheart, but those were historical picks. Yeah. Based, I guess, in some part of truth. Oh, she just beat up another woman? Is that the daughter? No, 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 no. I thought it was. Okay. Did she just whip her? Yeah. She, she was hissing. <laughs> hissing. <laughs> if, um, if you have a, uh, if you have an, oh, here we go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, we're going to see Conan be Conan here. He's mm-hmm. going to pick some shit up and dump it out. Yeah. You ain't gonna see Subutai do that. Yeah, you're gonna see a head in that soup. Oh, there you go, you big ass bowl, yeah. 
when you have an ensemble, yeah, that's uh, right. when you have an ensemble cast like mm-hmm. this movie, like an X Men movie or something like that, um, these characters don't have superpowers. Yeah. They I have mean. different weapons. They have mm-hmm. different abilities. It's you know, it, it's like when you're playing Dungeons and Dragons or you're putting your uh, you know, or you're 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 putting your your party together for like a Final Fantasy game or something like that, mm-hmm. um, or even when you're coming up with your your tag team on a wrestling game or something like that. You want your characters, if you're creating something, you want your characters to have different abilities. So Subotai is going to have arrows, and he's going to be light on his feet. He's going to be sneaky. Um, they have their own strengths and weaknesses. Like, yeah, he's light on his feet. Right. He has arrows. Valerius. Arnold is strength. Arnold's got strength. Uh, or uh, Conan's got strength, endurance, uh, sword, uh, sword skill, swordsmanship. Mm-hmm. Swordsmanship, um, yeah. Valeria is a master thief mm-hmm. and can slit your throat in a heartbeat. You and know, smile at you while you do it. And smile at you while she's doing it. This dude's got a hammer, you know. And there's... Um, there's all kinds of little tricks to uh, uh, to keep uh, to keep the ball rolling, to, mm-hmm. to keep things uh, visually interesting enough, so that you can pique the audience's interest, so that you can keep the audience uh, wrapped up in the narrative, and that's when you play the master tricks. Um, the little tricks are, of course, having these, uh, having this uh, fight scene and all these different characters doing what they do best, and all these different cutaways. And here comes Valeria with her sword, and there went, you know, there went Subotai, and there went Conan, and, and now Valeria is gonna, you know, rough this dude up, and on mm-hmm. and on, right? But then the master stroke comes when you actually use that to further the story along. And see how she's patting that sword on her oh, hands. Oh, like, look at that, man. She's like, she's telling these guys, come on, get some of this. She just ran up a wall. And not quite like Jackie Chan oh, and Rumble in like the Jackie Bronx, Chan but does. I mean, pretty good. Or uh, where did Jackie Chan borrow that from? From uh, uh, Singing in the Rain. Uh, no, not, you couldn't, I couldn't tell you. Oh, man, not, uh, mm. not, um, not Gene Kelly, but the other guy. Uh, the Irishman, I forget. But... Um, Help him. Yeah, she, I mean, uh-oh, somebody's going to be pissed. Yeah. But the boss is mad! Which Infidel they, defilers. They should all drown in lakes, lakes of blood. blood. Or this, now it's personal. I mean, Now you, they don't know why they are afraid of the dark. There guard. it is. No, why they, they fear the night. Just some, some great dialogue here. Just Absolutely. Great, almost poetry in a way. Absolutely. It's, re- it's really well written. Yeah, this night scene. I wonder how they filmed it. They use a filter. And I that think that's stuff. day for night. That's day like night, that's okay. like the you know you see it in the Wild Bunch. You see it. Uh, is it called Magic it? Time? Um, well, like no. no. Uh, day for night is when they uh, is when they film it during they the film day. It during the day, but they just slap a filter, slap a filter, on, filter on it. Yeah, and make they, it look they, like they, night. It's, it's literally day for Probably night. Probably too difficult to film it at night. And get a what ma- they want. A magic time shot is when is when the sun is just right, either in the morning or in the evening. and you got to get that shot real, real quick. Oh, here go. He's whipping out the sneak arrow. Takes out a snake. Seek, he tells it. Yeah. So here's the master stroke. I talked about it. Uh, or we we were talking about it a, a few minutes ago. Um, that there's always a price. Mm-hmm. If you're watching this movie and, and like for the first time, I don't mean right now. Hopefully you're not. But if uh, the first time you mm-hmm. watch this movie. You're hopefully really enthralled enough in the action that you're thinking, yeah, they got away. They got one over on the bad guy, and then he does this. That arrow, that snake arrow, takes out Valeria. And you know, because you know what snakes do, um, that that's it. That's it. And that, and then that price has to be paid. You are emotionally invested in the narrative enough to care about these characters and to cheer them on. And, and then when something happens to him, you feel like shit. You feel like shit. You feel really, you feel really bad for. I, I feel worse. Um, I feel worse for Valeria throughout this film uh, than I feel for Conan right around here. Mm-hmm. But I feel really bad for Conan. It's uh, it's pretty, t- it's pretty terrible. What happens here? Oh yeah, yeah this is yeah, this yeah. is a tearjerker. I wa- I watched this a couple of uh, oh. Just saying, kiss me. Yeah, just kiss me. God damn. See, we got soft hearts. I got I well yeah definitely. It's a sad scene. Let me Let breathe me. my last breath into your mouth. Oh my goodness. 
Let me breathe my last breath into your mouth. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's rough, man. Because you care about these characters. Because they've bonded. And we've bonded with them. And that's the mark of good writing and storytelling. You hooked us. Absolutely. We're rooting for these guys. Anything Definitely. happens to them, it just hurts us a whole lot. And that's, that's, that's also something that... Um, that a lot of the time uh, film can pull off uh, sometimes better than prose and sometimes better than, say, comic books or anything else. Video games do it well, too, actually. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're playing a video game yeah. and you get emotionally invested in the characters, uh, I've, I've, you know, my beautiful wife has mm -hmm. played a lot of those Final Fantasy games and she's yeah. got, you know... <laughs> She gets very upset when a favorite character uh, dies. Dies you, off with. If you've watched a, uh, if you've watched a few seasons of Doctor Who and some uh, several seasons oh, of that show, right? Yeah, I've never watched the Doctor God. Who episodes. They're all. I could probably find on Hulu. Uh, they're they're on they're on Netflix. Mm -hmm. But uh, there are episodes of that show that are super tear jerkers, definitely. But um. I'm trying to think, like you say, investment in the characters, maybe to an extent Star Trek with the original crew. Absolutely. I've always said that they're probably one of the best families in entertainment. Absolutely. Now, off the set, we know they've had issues. There's always <laughs> bickering about shots and just egos getting in the way. But, like, when you watch the end of Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, you can't just help but feel a little bit of tears when they're doing that final shot on the bridge. They save the Earth and the universe one last time, and Kirk gives his final log saying this is the final cruise of the Enterprise under my command. We're going to boldly go where no man, no one has gone before. Yeah. They show the Enterprise going off into the sun, and they had the, the rise of the Star Trek theme. I used to, I used to get very, uh, I, I used to get very emotionally invested in Star Trek movies. I did too, um, yeah. Especially the Nick Meyer films. Especially oh, yeah, two, two and six. Four and six, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Four also, because yeah. he wrote, he, he, he co-wrote four, he wrote, yeah. Oh, oddly enough, he wrote the comedy scenes. It's yeah, four. I think he wrote the comedy scenes. And <laughs> now he did write two. There's a little yeah. fact. He he wrote two. He just didn't get credit for yeah. it for some reason. And then six, obviously, uh, he got involved with that one. But six was always one of my favorites. I remember I saw that several times in the theater. It's just that they went out on a bang because number one, you had the bad taste of Star Trek Five. <laughs> and I was like, look, don't let these guys go out like that. And they had everybody working together to do this thing. Which, which serves as a fun little B-movie now. Mm -hmm. if, you yeah. if you watch it now, it's like, oh, well, that's a lot of fun. And happy 25th anniversary to probably the most disliked Star Trek movie. Star Trek 5 Star is 25 Trek years old this year. Frontier. Yep. Um, we get a funeral pyre here. We get a funeral pyre here. Um, probably a year before Dar Darth Vader's funeral yeah, pyre. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, we, we also get... Um, we get kind of an emotional release here, which is what a funeral is. A little cathartic in um, a way, yeah. Uh, a teacher uh, that I had in college once uh, had a had a very, uh, um, I, I thought I thought a very intelligent thing to say about uh, about funerals. He said that funerals are not for the dead; funerals are for the living. And I had never really thought of it that way. Um, but it was, uh, I, I, I think that to an extent that's true. I mean, we, we go to funerals we, to, uh, to move on. We to need move that on. ritual. Closure. We need that closure. We need that ritual. That's to a, put them on the ground that know they are yeah. passed on, dead and buried. And that's, that's kind of a John Ford thing. Mm -hmm. um, his, films, uh, his films relied on ritual mm -hmm. uh, quite a bit. And, and films in general, um, the good ones anyway, uh, they do show us the the practices that human beings uh, go through, the things that hu the things that human beings do in order to move on. Um, whether it's uh, you know th these these rites of passage, like when you you know movies like about you know, oh I gotta go get my driving test, like license to license drive, to right? Drive. It's a it's a rite of passage. And um briefly on license to drive <laughs> the late james avery, james avery when he had the part of the drive instructor last name first first name last and then the, he had that clipboard and that the, sound that made that the shredder <laughs> himself the shredder james himself james. 68 uncle phil, yeah. uncle phil um, he passed away we miss him but um definitely but uh that's Man. that that takes a movie like that would be about giant snakes and barbarians cutting heads off and makes it human 
and makes it work for an audience in 1982 and makes it work for an audience in 2014. This scene, too. Pretty emotional. Th uh, they're well, getting ready for the final battle right well, here. Yeah, well, this is the calm before the storm. This yeah. is the buffer, right? Because mm -hmm. you just had that big battle sequence and then that big, big tragic moment and then this huge bonfire, uh, funeral pyre, and then, okay, we got to calm down a little bit talk about flowers and and uh that this if if this were made if this were set in the in in modern times they'd probably be talking about surfing yeah but, they'd probably uh, be talking about surfing or mcdonald's or McDonald's? they'd probably get some quentin tarantino as dialogue for some reason <laughs> oh, or another God. um um but um we're about we're about to get back on that teamwork thing mm -hmm. where uh Conan, Subotai, and th this scene is mirrored in Predator also, mm, right? Yeah. yeah, when he's telling Dylan, he's like, well, instead of complaining, why yeah, should help? Maybe then, you should help, right? And then when the, it didn't work, he said, we're going to try next cheese. But yeah, it's teamwork once again with just these two gentlemen now. And if you work with, if, if you work with someone or, you go, or you're in a class with someone who does nothing but complain, mm -hmm. um, maybe they could get a lesson from a movie like this. You know, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe they could... Uh, Stand to help out a little bit mm -hmm. and uh, get work some together. stuff and work and work together and get some stuff. You done. know, for everyday life, maybe you don't know how to bring that experience to work. Maybe watch a movie but to an extent. Maybe Battle Beyond the Stars, <laughs> the science fiction the version samurai, of the Samurai. Yeah, samurai, yeah. <laughs> different personalities, different quirks working together. We get some comedy here again yeah. with uh, lighting things up a little bit. Yeah. Or the scene where they're prepping stuff. I mean, I know it's here in Conan the Barbarian. Think about the A Team. If you watch a lot Definitely, of episodes. Yeah. Folks, if you watch the A-Team, if you watch one episode, you've seen them all except for season five. Is that... Uh, is that when Robert Vaughn... That's when Robert Vaughn and they got caught and they were forced to do missions for him. And then the show got the plug pulled on it unceremoniously. Yeah. So they really... We never had... That was the sucky thing. Like, you talk about funerals and resolution. Yeah. That show didn't get it. But they did that with a lot of shows in the 80s. I think they just... The ratings were low. They didn't yank them off. They didn't get a good send-off. Uh, the original Star Trek never got a send-off. The A team, they never got a send off. Remember, they were about to complete all the missions. They, pro they probably would have gotten their pardons, yeah. but they canceled out the show. Conan, Knight Rider uh, never had a send off, no. I think. This they just year, ended uh, Battlestar Galactica didn't mm -hmm. have a send off. Uh, like, if we're talking Glenn Larson, right? Uh, yeah. His, his Larceny stuff, is they call him. Glenn Larson. Larceny, yeah. That poor guy. Yeah. <laughs> I swear. You try to make that's a, what, that's what they call to make him, yeah. a buck at mm -hmm. being a creative person, and people call you. Terrible names, basically. All right, they're name. on the horses and the daughters. Oh, yeah, man. Here comes a big battle scene. Big Bo ass booby tra and, um, booby traps and all. Yep. And here comes um, the big speech, mm -hmm. right? Yes, we're going to, we can mouth it off to you guys. This, is probably, this is probably the second most quoted uh, speech from the film. Oh, uh, okay. I had a buddy who. I had a buddy who knew every line, and he would say it every once in a while, just <laughs> just as a gag. Uh, John Segura, he was a, he was a good guy, man. He's uh, he, he's no longer with us, but he was a good dude. Here you man. go. He says, "Chrome, I've never prayed to you before. I have no tongue for it. No one, not even you, will remember if we were good men or bad, why we fought or why we died. No." All that matters is that two stood against many. That's what's important. Valor pleases you, Crom, so grant me one request. Grant me revenge. <laughs> and if you do not listen, then the hell with you. And that's, now that's pure Milius right there. Pure all, all that, all that like history buff kind of stuff. No mm -hmm. one will know who, fought, why we fought. You know who were the good who guys. Who were the guys who were that, the bad that guys. were going to stand and make the stand? No one's, no one's going to know. All they know is like some shit went down, right? And then, what was interesting about that speech? He's praying to a god. Oh man, just <laughs> look at that sword. Cut this dude open off the horse. Boom. This, folks, when you watch this action scene, this is how they need to go back to filming it today. Yeah. Don't put the camera in and let me just see this. Uh, just put it in between the two dudes and Arnold swinging the axe. Let the actors act and let the yeah. stuntmen do their job. Man. Do their job, exactly. Yeah, the, the, the editor, uh, well, um, th there, was a, uh, there was a comparison 
bec- because digital editing was becoming the thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, there was a comparison between the cuts in the original Star Wars, the cuts in Empire, and the cuts yeah. in Jedi, mm-hmm. and how Jedi had more cuts. Yeah. And there, there's there's more individual shots, and that's because they had the ability to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, you're getting to that here. Mm-hmm. Uh, where that for a film that was probably and again more stunt horse work I'm not yeah. crazy about that but uh, no biggie mm-hmm. um, for a movie that was uh, that was probably cut um, if this was cut on a on a computer it was one of the really early ones so I kind of mm-hmm. doubt it after Skywalker Ranch I'm pretty sure this was done on oh, uh, this one um, oh, I'm pretty sure uh, this was done we'll on to a, check the an old fashioned yeah, yeah we'll still be talking like the credits Viola style yeah you know. But um, it, yeah, it, it certainly see. holds up. Oh, it, it damn sure holds up today. I mean, look how we're talking about it. Well, and um, we're not one of these people who say the old is still the best. To an extent, we are. We still like good stuff nowadays. It's yeah. just, we well, just disagree with some of the techniques. Good, and I think there's good people filmmaking, out there. Good filmmaking is good filmmaking. I've sat, mm-hmm. through, I've sat through movies that were um, 50, 60, 70, 80 years old that I'm like, mm-hmm. good God, this is awful. It's, yeah. it, it's, it, it takes doesn't age so well. long for it. To, and then I've seen... Um, James Whale, right? Mm-hmm. Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein. Yeah. Um, those movies are films. Th- those mm-hmm. those are works of art, man. And uh, those uh, those movies from that time, uh, the good ones, you can tell they're made with passion. And if, passion and if care. a film's made with passion and a film's made with some damn sense, yes, wide shot, medium shot, close up, and use it when it counts. Use a close up when it matters. Don't just use a um, uh, the, my, my example uh, that I can always point to, of all things, episodes of old sitcoms, The Brady Bunch, mm-hmm. when the Bradys go to Hawaii. Yeah. You don't see a close-up until Robert Reed is at the Pearl Harbor marker. Mm-hmm. Robert Reed's standing at the Pearl Harbor marker and, read, and, and reading the, the plate. Yeah. And uh, there's a close-up, there's a close-up of, of Mr. Brady at that point. But there mm-hmm. isn't a close-up. It's all wide shots and medium shots and twos and threes. Um for just about the whole episode, mm-hmm. and you save a close-up for when it matters. Like uh, maybe John Carpenter, maybe that had to be one of our podcasts for the thing. Because I'll declare this with John Carpenter's the thing. I think it's one of the best directed horror movies ever. Yes, we'll get to that to another time. Yes, uh, but yeah, it's well, just, just Carpenter. Using, well, Carpenter comes from the same school, uh, the same you know, the same uh, style of filmmaking as a mm-hmm. guy like Milius. They come from that. Howard Hawks style uh-huh. of uh, of storytelling, and um, with this battle scene right now, he gets the fake Conan and gets <laughs> oh. gets impaled or gets that spike through the gut. Wow, there goes he hits that rock. Yep, <clears throat> brutal guys. Die. Um, wish fulfillment. Mm-hmm. Movies like this tend to be, and I don't know if I harped on this earlier. Uh, they tend to be exercises in wish fulfillment. Like I said, we payback. Want, it's like, yeah, hey, we, there's we, somebody I don't like, or yeah. this is something I could have done if I could do it the way Conan does. Dirty Harry. Dirty Harry. Also yeah. Also a John Milius. Uh, the second movie. Yeah. Well, he, Magnum Four. He co-wrote the second movie. He wrote the speech in the first one, though. Oh, that's used, right. That's right. Yes. Shots are only five. That's mm-hmm. all. That's all John Milius. I think he did some punch up mm-hmm. on the script in the first one. I, I uncredited. Okay. Here we go. She okay. Came back. So. Valeria returns, which and she uh, says, "This is one for you, Conan." Yeah. Which, Do you want to live forever? She's sparkling, animated sparkling. Oh man! And and th- there's that line which, if you've seen, if you you know, if you're watching the movie the first time, she says, "Do you want to live forever?" Mm-hmm. What two times before? I think so. And it's like, oh, okay, I guess that's her catchphrase, right? Mm-hmm. But then she says it here. Yep. And it has a whole other meanings like you want to live forever Mm -hmm. like because here it is i fulfilled Mm -hmm. i fulfilled my promise so now oh he he guts this guy cuts that sword off now now he's now he's like super conan right Mm -hmm. he can he can destroy swords with his right it's like my sword is better um bears in his shoulder slices him across again this is all good voice again oh no um (laughs) she returns to fulfill one last uh one last promise which Mm -hmm is going to boost Conan into mythological status. This is now a myth. This, this is now bigger than just a sword and sorcery flick. It's bigger than just a comic book movie or a pulp movie. This is mythology. And now you get it. If you didn't get it then, 
well, if, if you didn't get it from the first scene, well, sorry, I guess it's just not your thing. But um, he's about to, I mean, what, what she does, and oh, no. Now she's calling him father. Oh, man. Oh, he saves the girl. Who, wow, imagine that. But um, get that snake away from me, Jesus Christ. Um, Conan is oh, now <laughs> he's he's now uh, elevated to this uh, mythological status, which kind of reminds me of uh, Kurt Russell in Tombstone. Mm-hmm. There's a moment in Tombstone where Wyatt Earp starts it. it it's the acting is is kind of strained, but um, and I love Kurt Russell by the way. I, I'll, I'm not. He's always bad. I'll ass, never yeah. say anything bad about Kurt except that one little thing. Yeah. But um, <laughs> Kurt uh, Wyatt Earp starts saying no mm-hmm. no and he gets up and in fabulous uh, George P. Cosmatos uh, John Woo-esque uh, slow motion he starts firing back and he just walks out there while these other guys are like what the hell is he doing and he just boom 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 and doesn't get hit once right well, you know, the kind of thing that... Wasn't that uh, the thing about Wyatt Earp? He never got hit once? Because I saw the Kevin Costner Wyatt Earp. I've seen it this, once. A long now time this ago. this is the thing with Wyatt Earp, those two movies when they came out within... I think in the same year... No, Tombstone was first and Wyatt Earp. Uh, I, saw, I had seen Wyatt Earp first. And it was only until last year or two years ago I watched Tombstone... I have to say I did like Tombstone better because it's a little oh, bit more God, lean. Because so they kept the, they kept it focused on the oh, Tombstone. Oh yeah. But now if you were to play the, it's got better acting. It's yeah, it's a little bit better acting. And if you were to play back the gun the gunfight, the OK Corral scenes between Tombstone and Wyatt Earp. Yeah. Do a comparison. Since I'd have a comparison up until I watched Tombstone, I was like, yeah, Tombstone does win though. It's a okay more fun. Corral. It's a more fun movie, and that's yeah. that's why it's um, that's why it's 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 more people liked it. I yeah. Think, and more people like it now. But my point is that whether it's Conan, whether it's Tombstone, mm-hmm. no matter what, uh, the best films make the unbelievable believable. And they do it not through special effects, but they do it through the craft of storytelling. They mm-hmm. do it through the craft of good writing and good acting and good direction. And in, in the case of Basil Polidorus, you know, great, uh, great music to go along with it. Um, the, the, it's... If this film, this film needs special effects, of course, because it's a fantasy film, but it's not the special effects, which are kind of rinky-dink if you look at them now, yeah. that make the story work. It's it, it's the craft of storytelling. And even they're not, the, they're not the overwhelming movie. the story either. Yeah. Because no, the special it, effects are minimal, because that is probably... It's tough to say what the movies nowadays are, the special effects overwhelm the story, but... These movies get bigger and bigger. You got it's almost like they have no choice. No. You do a Spider-Man movie, you really can't skimp on the special effects. No. You do a Transformers movie, you can't skimp on the special you, effects. You can't. You can't have. You can't have a movie like that with just Peter Parker in a room talking about his soul or whatever. Yeah, kind of you know. like Godzilla. Right. You know, there's been complaints that there wasn't enough Godzilla, but then oh, it was fine. It was just fine. You know, you have it to bounce it. Oh yeah, it was long, but. <laughs> Hey, it wasn't Transformers Age of Extinction long, remember? Two yeah, hours, 45 minutes. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't know. <laughs> yeah, never see, I'll, I'll, I'll never check see it out that. the Dial 50 Theater. Uh, I'm done with those. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. I just watch them out. What obligation? I don't know. It's like, I just have to see what happens. Just say I saw in the theater. Okay, now we're coming up on the scene where Conan sneak up on Thulsa Doom. You and I will probably talk about this in just a minute. Oh, this yeah. scene reminds you of the ending of a particular movie. We'll see if you can guess it, or you probably jump on it um, with what happens. So Conan is going up to Thos of Doom. He's probably know, got him right away once. I know him. there was some glare on the lens there. Mm-hmm. I don't think little, that's my new flare. I don't think that's my new glasses. No, no, I got my contacts on. It's the same thing. So they got the that's little real, lens that's glare. That's real glare. That's mm-hmm. not. Uh, that, that's not. Uh, what's his name with the lens flares? Uh, J.J. Abrams yeah. is always. <laughs> now it's funny when he's talking about like. I'm your father, oh, probably yeah. metaphorically in a way, yeah. not literally, it's just that, um, or figuratively, excuse me, that I'm your father, because he keeps saying, well, if it wasn't me, you wouldn't be the guy that you are now. Absolutely. I gave birth to you. And then this, this, um, I love the Empire Strikes Back. What was your world, yeah. Love the, the Empire Strikes Back, but this, mm. I think this has better writing. Um, now, here's the line, what's he saying? My son? My son. How many times does he say that? Now, Conan's like, oh my gosh, he keeps saying my son. 
like he's trying to draw him. And yeah. Conan's looking down. He's like, okay, yeah, this dude's my daddy in a way, figuratively. It's some of that. Well, it's, uh, he is... He's doing what Falsa Doom does best. Flesh is stronger, right? Mm -hmm. I can so, control your mind. But nope. Conan, Conan's already heard the secret, you mm -hmm. see. It's like Auric Goldfinger giving away his, uh, what, his what he's, what he's going to do with that satellite and, and the laser and all that, mm -hmm. or whatever the hell it was in Goldfinger. Yeah. It's like a Bond villain giving up, mm -hmm. well, you see, <laughs> that kind of shit. Yeah, lay out the plot. Falsa okay. Doom's already given away that he believes that Flesh is stronger. And um, Conan says the blade is strong, so he couldn't yeah. be Conan, now he just Con decapitated Thor, so he's showing it to everybody. He said, it, Conan says, if if we're talking a battle of wills, Buster, mm -hmm. well... You ain't gonna win. You ain't got go, no shot. Let's go bowling, because uh, I got a great ball here. Mm -hmm. He rolls that down. That is gross. And this is this is the first step to becoming king. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're gonna become a... If you're gonna become king, right, you become a legend first. And hey, mm -hmm. uh... Destroying an entire cult, you nope. know, not by killing them, but by taking away what they believe in and showing it for what it truly is. It's like true evil. Here you go, as your leader. And, and what do they it's do? It's very symbolic. They start bowing to him. Yeah. What, what, what do they do? They go, ah, oh, shit. Well, let's go home. Mm hmm. Oh, but I just bought a new tent. And see, we're talking about all this stuff with what you say is once he kills Skull of Doom, you take away that power, the leadership, and they see it for what it is. That's the substance in the movie that you're looking into. I don't know if you would get that too much nowadays. Now, when I was talking about how this scene reminds you of a particular movie, think about Up Up's Now, the ending. They yes. kill Kurtz. And then what's Martin Sheen's character do after he kills Kurtz? He comes out to the cult. That's right. Which is the tribe. Now he just drops his weapon. He didn't behead Kurtz. There was a beheading in Apocalypse Now with the chef character. Yeah. But remember, uh, Martin Sheen drops his weapon and they play that music from the Rhythm Devils. And don't or the, uh, and don't, the uh, don't, don't Kurtz's followers start... They start parting away. Yeah, yeah. And then they start laying down their weapons and you just hear all these weapons drop and it's a wonderfully shot scene. And I love this. He's going to think for a while. Yeah. He... Um, he may be an Arnold character, but he becomes he, he is a thinking man's action hero. There there's there's a lot of really cool uh there's a lot of really cool things of uh, uh scenes of Arnold just thinking. sitting there with this look on his face, you know? And instead of just hacking away. Hacking away, yeah. And that's what he's probably not getting credit for in these movies, is that Conan, yes he has brute strength, but he's also a thinker. He's intelligent, he's yeah. cunning. Yeah. You know, he didn't get to where he was just on his strength alone. I mean, he had to trip and fall at some points. Uh, where are we? Is this uh, Subutai coming in? I don't think we get... Do we even get Subutai again? Um, I watched it a oh, couple no, no, weeks no. It's ago. The daughter. There's the... Uh, King Osric's daughter. King Osric's and now daughter. it looks like she's about to bow to him or worship him. Yeah, that's what... Okay, that's yeah. what it is. Now, um, John Milius was... Um, was he an original writer on Apocalypse Now? He, he is a co... Uh, He's credited as the final screenplay, and I think. And George Lucas was going was one to one of the writers. He was going to direct it. I was like, this dude was going to direct Apocalypse Now? Like no Luke, way. Lucas is all kinds of sunshine and rainbows yeah. compared to Coppola. Coppola, exactly. But I think the final credit for the screenplay on Apocalypse Now is John Milius. Yeah. John Milius and uh, Francis Ford Coppola. And um, now, speaking of screenplays, from what I understand... Um, the original script of Conan the Barbarian was just Oliver Stone. I think so. Oliver Stone wanted it to be a much crazier movie. He wanted way he like he like way more snake stuff and mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff. And apparently, it would have gone over budget. Budget, yeah. Um, which, and when you uh, try and make a movie like this in 1982, yeah. When you hear about budget constraints in movies, especially 30 plus years ago, it was a miracle they could pull off what they do. But nowadays, you have studios or owned by corporations that can just pretty much throw a check at it and you're covered. You're really not going to say, well, we didn't have enough money. And CG can do a whole well, lot more. Well, most of the time they say we didn't have enough money. It was like probably not to the extent that they could pull off stuff. It was like, well, uh, I mean, heck, when you spend $225 million on a Transformers movie or Pirates of the Caribbean, you really can't sit there and say we didn't have enough money in the budget. Okay, so Conan um, just walks right past her. Just walks right Good past her. Good for you, yeah. dude. Good job. Hey, man, it, you, you lose a lady like Valeria. Mm -hmm. uh, 
nobody's going to compare. Nobody's going to compare, exactly. Well, Nothing like the first. At least not until two years later when mm. he gets a kiss from uh, Olivia Diabo. Diabo, yeah. But, was, uh, was she one of the Bond girls? Or am I I, she was. Someone? She was in okay. uh, one of the Timothy Living Dalton Daylights. Films. But he, he at least, he at least takes, her with her, takes her with him because, well, he's... He's a caring guy. He's a, well, he's, he's got to take her back to Dad. Got to take her to Dad, number one. Yeah, that's still his mission, you know. So it's it's a tragedy, mm-hmm. um, but it's a tragedy in which the hero lives. The hero um, lives and the, he does triumph. The hero lives, the hero triumphs, but uh, he does he does not get, a, get out without some uh, sense of loss. Well, and you talk about that very quickly. Think about the ending of Unforgiven with yeah. Clint Eastwood. Is that the shootout in the bar was awesome, but it was kind of cathartic. But you also felt like there was still a loss at the end. Yes, yes. It's Clint Eastwood going back into his mode. Okay, I'll pick on that in a minute. We're at the end of the movie, almost. He's sitting on a little chair, and he's got probably a fake beard, and then they're doing a title crawl right me, now. Me with me with my silly wrestling fixation. Um, <laughs> The wrestler mm-hmm. Triple H, yeah, uh, from Degeneration X and all mm-hmm. that. He's he's married to Stephanie McMahon, who's in if you can get it. Yeah, um, <laughs> he has shown up to WrestleMania several times mm-hmm. with this King Conan looking oh entrance, my gosh. Mm-hmm. Um, where he's where he's sitting on a throne and mm-hmm. the throne comes up, mm-hmm. and and I think a lot of that had to do with Triple H. Uh, trolling for the role mm-hmm. in um, what was supposed to be uh, apparently rumored of for a while there mm-hmm. was supposed to be like a Conan and Son uh, type of film. King mm-hmm. Conan with yeah. his young son, uh, who Triple H would have played if they had made the movie. And mm-hmm. now uh, Hun- uh, Triple H, uh, Hunter Hearst Helmsley, Jean Paul Levesque. He uh, he said, no, no, no. I'm much more interested in running this company because mm-hmm. I'm going to be uh, much more well off than I had made than if I had decided to go make movies or whatever, and mm-hmm. also because I can't act as well as The Rock. But we won't get into that. Yeah, but, exactly. Um, I think he's is he cranking out some movies, Triple H, or they're going like he's direct done, to he's video. He's done a couple. Yeah, mm-hmm. but they're all for WWE films. But, okay. Um, those last few moments, they got a they got a real silent film quality to them, like mm-hmm. just like a lot of uh, a lot of moments in the the film. Um, yeah, not a lot of dialogue, and this is what I was like about a lot of 80s movies seem to do this. Yes. Like, the dialogue was always sparse in some scenes, especially here in Conan. And also, like, to an extent, The Hitcher yes. has a lot of dialogue-free scenes. That's uh, a lot of that, um, if, if you're real cynical, mm-hmm. it's the foreign market. The foreign market? It's the foreign market, because mm-hmm. um, dialogue-heavy films don't do as well in other countries. Good. You know, <laughs> as they do here. Mm-hmm. So... Um, you're not going to, you know, a John Cassavetes film is not going to play as well in another country as it's as it's I mean, it's not even going to play that well here because most mm-hmm. people here don't even like dialogue heavy films. But um action is one of those things that, that mean, yeah. movies do better probably than any other any other type of media. Mm-hmm. Um this has great dialogue too though. Yes. You get the one two punch. It, movies do not have to be all dialogue or all action. You can yeah. get both. Those those Tarantino movies do the same thing. Um mm-hmm. even even the more dialogue heavy ones, right? Like, like Jackie John Brown. Sales movie. John Sa- John Sales is. But I mean, uh, it's a drama movie. He's yeah. good with his dialogue. But then when you go into the art house to watch those type of drag movies, yeah, you, you're talking two hours and change of dialogue straight up. Yeah. And um, you you mentioned that about the foreign markets, so they don't like a lot of dialogue heavy movies. Think about the Sergio Leone westerns where they have those long takes or right. And well, uh, the the. The perception is that dialogue-heavy movies wouldn't. You know, I, sh- I should mm-hmm. amend that. I think that's cynical Hollywood. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, um, most of our movies are not just made for us anymore. Most of our movies are made for a worldwide market mm-hmm. now. And you know, Very, I, yeah. I understand. You know, I understand. That's that where and, the money is. That's probably why they can spend so much on these movies because they can recoup it worldwide. Versus, and, yeah, you gonna scratch a check two hundred plus million on a movie that. May not have its appeal outside yeah. the United States. You better have an awesome movie. Absolutely, and and there there's so many there's so many different ways. Negative cutter, color timer, okay. tempo editing. So yeah, this is mm. you know this old, is still old school. old school editing, man. And then we got um, the cast of characters. A good ben Davison was okay. I can't the witch Cassandra Gaola, Jerry Lopez was Subari, Subotai, excuse me, and if Valerie uh, Quinnison was the princess. Really good, uh, yeah. really good cast, and uh, 
a really great film, followed yeah. by a much campier much sequel. Much maligned sequel. Successful um, financially, but much maligned. Yeah, no Conan, Conan the Destroyer, again, the first one you saw, the first one I saw, because it was on cable all the yeah, time. Yeah, it was back on cable then. all the time. Now. I mean, I did see it in the theaters at the old Windsor Park Mall, Conan the Destroyer. Yeah, but um, that is another story, and... Uh, We'll get to that one. If uh, do you think you want to do Conan the Destroyer uh, this time, or you want to wait till another time, or just not do that one? <laughs> I'm game for it if you want to do it now, or however you're feeling. We probably just got to take a little bit of a break. I got piss so fucking bad right there now. There you go. We probably need a little break. But, I got uh, piss so bad. I'm gonna pause this. Okay, we're All gonna right. pause. We're gonna take a little break, and we're gonna just have a Conan marathon.